Howdy, can you give me a good long sentence? Because you came out kind of muffled to begin with. Oh, yeah, no, I apologize. Some connection issues, but I'm good. Uh, this is long enough sentence for you. Should be good. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, you sound, uh, you sound good. Howdy. Perfect. Howdy. Uh, what is on Thank your mind this you. fine day? Well, wait, introduce yourself first. Okay, so first of all, my name is Rose Millet. Um, I've debated some recent streamers. I think I debated um, Destiny about a month ago. I know I debated Xander Hall a few years back, and I've kind of like worked my way in the scene, but I'm assuming most people won't know who I am. That's okay. Um, overall, I'm a transgender woman, right? And, you know, that obviously <laughs> accounts for a lot of my political beliefs, but I have a very unique perspective. I think there's a problem where a lot of trans people are like in one area where there's not a lot of people who have like nuance or you see like the space online transgender stuff. It's all like, it seems like a monolith from the outside and it bothers me. And then on the flip side, you have people like Blair White. So whenever someone doesn't fall, they think automatically you're like this extreme. You're basically a turf. I hate turf just as much as everyone else. Now, obviously, you know, I'm not just going to talk about trans issues today, right? Um, I'm anti-gun. I don't think guns should be allowed. So I was hearing you talk about that a few minutes ago. Obviously, we'll get into that. I am also a pro-life transgender woman. That is a you know controversial take a lot of people have. Um, but you know, I'll get into that when the time comes. Uh, overall, just uh, a lot of really interesting opinions. I also think that you have a lot of very radical beliefs. That kind of turns people away from the left. I see lots of clips of you floating around. And it's maybe not the best optics, but... I mean, there's all of that and more to get into. Uh, I, is that a good introduction? Uh, yeah, I would definitely say you've covered a, a good few bases. What do you want to touch on yeah. first? Um, do you have a preference? Is there anything that like sticks to you and say, yeah, this, this is the one I want to uh, go off? Or... None whatsoever. I, I, I defer entirely to you. It's my woke feminist predisposition there. Oh, see, you mentioned the woke feminist stuff. I'm not a feminist myself, so... Uh, I guess that's, uh, I guess, we'll, I guess we'll start there. Uh, maybe I, so in feminist spaces, I always feel like excluded for being a transgender woman. Like a lot of the times, like they'll be, okay. So I see like the, my, your, my body, my choice or no uterus, no opinion. That's like a transphobic thing by nature, but it's like, okay, you're excluding trans women, but you're trying to be inclusive. Actually, you know, I think I want to start with guns. You just started talking about guns. I think you mentioned that. I think we want to start there. Yeah, hit me up. Okay. So I was writing down the things that you were saying. So first of all, I, I think we can reach common ground in one place. First of all, assault weapons. I agree with you in the sense that it's like, you know, you have a school shooting with like 12 deaths. You ban assault weapons. There's going to be like eight instead of 12. That doesn't really solve a systemic issue. It's like it helps, but you're not really addressing the full issue of the problem. I just don't believe that death machines should be normalized. I don't think there is a logical, logistical reason for people to be walking around with these in their every regular day lives. Like people will say, oh, but I use it to go hunting. It's like, okay, but do you, is that an excuse to like have something around that kills people? And it's like, obviously, you know, school shootings all the time. People say, you know, with all these shootings going on, obviously you would said it accounts for the small percentage of the deaths. If you make guns harder to access, you limit the amounts, a lot less young black men are going to die in these poor neighborhoods, and that's the majority of these cases. So in this instance, I don't see a good reason to advocate for guns or to say, yeah, minorities need guns to protect themselves. No, the guns are what's actually hurting the minorities here. I think you have it all backwards. I mean, I think we're, we're conflating a couple of categories here. My advocacy for firearms mostly comes down to the fact that I think that civil unrest in this country is near inevitable, and if civil unrest is to take place, I would rather it not be exclusively the people who I disagree with who have firearms. Um, the reason, like, the, the aforementioned, like, young black guys dying to gun deaths or whatever tends to be gang-related activity, and one of the issues with getting guns off the streets is that we have more guns in this country than, like, any other country does by far, by a huge margin. Uh, more guns than people in this country. Nothing else. No other country even comes close. So the issue is like, if we're if we're dealing in in the hair of reality here, you know, um, the idea of like getting guns off the street is kind of an unsolvable problem, at least in the current situation that we live in. The best way to deal with like gun crime in inner city areas would probably just be to address the economic inequality there, because that's what turns people towards the gang life that leads to them selling drugs because they don't have better opportunities. Now, don't get me wrong, my advocacy for gun here, it's not like a, a, like a 
principled, like, first order thing. If a world could be built where nobody really needed or wanted guns and there were pretty heavy regulations, I'd be fine with that. I am in favor of some forms of gun control. Um, but right now, I'm mostly concerned with, like, the right people having, a, having enough guns to defend their neighborhoods. Okay, so there's a few things I want to touch on. First of all, when you say the right people, I think that's very interesting and very telling. Like, there's such a right and wrong way to do it. First of all, when you talk about civil unrest, you know, being this prevalent thing, that's an issue I noticed with you and your content. You act like, you know, there's going to be this huge, like, violence, and it's like, oh, I, am I worried that conservatives are going to murder me because I'm trans? No, I don't think that's ever going to happen. And I think when you say things like that, you're pushing people away because people look and they look at reality and they say, no, this is not happening. This is not this like i understand the fear i understand you know there's some scary things going on but i think we need to be realistic in what's actually going on and not make those blanket statements now when you say that you know about guns i do think that you even said it yourself the fact that we have more guns than any other country i think that that in itself is a point to be proven that we should have less guns and that these laws should be a thing now yes these other you know social economical things they obviously do make a difference and I think it's important to address those. And, you know, I'm obviously for helping those communities, improving them. But that doesn't, you know, mean suddenly that, you know, we don't also address the fact that these guns are, in fact, a huge part of the problem. Well, sure. You're free to. And if you can find a way to get rid of all the guns in this country, or at least get rid of a large number of them, then I think we could take seriously that proposition. But at the moment, to my knowledge, no effort to decrease the number of guns in the United States has ever succeeded. I don't know if there's even like a theoretical way that you would go about doing that. In terms of fear-mongering or whatever else, I don't think that, not only do I think what I'm saying is reasonable, I don't even think I'm saying things that aren't already happening. During the Black Lives Matter protests, right-wing militias did make their move in a number of coastal cities at trying to impose a kind of, uh, you know, proxied political order in the areas that they were in. You know, everyone talks about Rittenhouse, but what about Portland, where there were, in fact, far-right groups on their, uh, you know, pickup trucks marauding on in uh, with a bunch of guns in the back, you know, trying to be faux cops. Uh, considering the fact that the Republican Party is openly anti-democracy, the idea of civil unrest in the future, it's not a possibility, really. It's just a seemingly inevitable consequence of them attaining power. Um, even if they don't, I mean, we saw January 6th, that's what happens when they don't attain power. There's no reason to believe these things are going to get better in the future, and I don't think there's anything wrong with preparing for them if they get worse. Well, I would say the fact that January 6th, you know, as awful as it was, the fact that nothing did happen from it is just proof that our democracy is great and that, you know, it's able to prevent these coups from happening. I say that's a plus for United States democracy. What I would also say is you said before, before you talked to me that, you know, school shootings account for such a small percent of gun deaths that it's not worth mentioning. Yeah, when you talk about the political violence being done by conservatives, that's also a very small percentage of violence or political violence in general being done. So yet you seem like that's a major thing to focus on, like this inevitable disaster is coming. When if you look at the statistics, I mean, how many people in the United States have died from conservative violence? Obviously, there's some, and every time it's a tragedy, and I hope the people that do that are locked in prison because it's just disgusting. But I don't think it's this systemic wide issue. Obviously, there's extremists like, you know, content, people trying to lead people those directions. You, we can have that discussion. But I don't, you know, think that there's going to be like, you know, any crazy like mass violence against any groups or well, that this is a serious threat that needs serious action. Everyone says it can't happen here till it happens here, right? I mean, you say that because January 6th didn't lead to the overthrow of the government, that's a sign of America's strength. But the beer hall putsch in Germany also did not lead to the overthrow of the Weimar Republic. The difference there being, of course, that Hitler was thrown in jail after the Beer Hall Putsch, and no Republican officials were thrown in jail after January 6th, even after it was found that many of them were complicit in organizing it. So I'd say we're setting things up pretty darn well for the future right now. Um, the, um, yeah, no, so, like, the, your, my, 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 my argument here isn't based on, like, conservative crime statistics. We have a party, the second largest party in the country, who is pretty openly anti-democracy, and if they attain power, I think there's fair reason to believe that they would use it to subvert our democracy. And in such a time of civil unrest, I think it's good that people be armed. You would agree that Republicans are anti-democracy, right? That there's no other way to reconcile their behavior, the support of the insurrection, the persistent months and years long lying about the results of the 2020 election, the fact that Donald Trump um, like it, it continues to like essentially prompt and threaten civil war 
uh, in speeches and in like social media behavior, suggesting that he's been wronged and that nothing but a violent insurrection can oust the, uh, you know, the democratic establishment, the QAnon pandering. I mean, it would be very difficult to look at that, all that and go like, yeah, when Republicans attain power, they definitely won't try to undermine our democracy. I think that there is a point to be had in the sense that when it comes to Joe Biden winning the election ferry, there was a disturbing amount of people who said, no, Joe Biden did not win this fair election because of, I don't know, reasons, mail-in voting, even though statistically been proven to actually be realistic, and it actually accounts for all the votes, people still said that that wasn't right. But my argument would be like when Trump won in 2016, people were saying, no, Hillary won this election. So it's like, yeah, is it different? Obviously, I think in this case, you know, the Republicans were maybe a little more extreme than 2016. But you at the think, same wait, time, I don't think... Wait, I'm sorry. I, I have to hold on that. Hillary Clinton conceded the election the next day. The people who said Hillary Clinton won the election did so because she won the popular vote while losing the electoral vote. Nothing that Hillary Clinton's fans did was like subverting democracy. It was criticism of the electoral college system. I don't think there's any comparison to be made between that. No, I, I know. I was, I was actually just about to say that. I don't think it's the same, but I think there's enough like seeds in the ground. I, I don't think it's, obviously, if you look at it, I think there's a lot more problem on one side than another. I think that is a fair point to make. And I do think that that's a worrying trend that we need to talk about. Um, but I don't think it's such a worrying trend that it's like people need to arm themselves, be prepared for this huge political unrest in the nation. I think, I so think we're fine. We have a party. I think the media just wants to make it seem like so extreme. And I think, I think we're okay. Backed an insurrection attempt for whom tens of millions of Americans still believe that the current sitting president is there illegitimately after cheating, who believe that there is a deep state that conspiratorially orchestrates the outcomes of American elections with a presidential frontrunner, Donald Trump, who not only did prompt all of this, but continues to threaten that our democracy is illegitimate. This isn't, you think the media is overblowing this? I think the media is underblowing this. What we're looking at right now is a pretty clear set of signals that the Republican Party, if given the power to, would just do away with democracy. They already have the courts. They're probably going to have the Senate. They might end up having the House. In 2024, if they win the presidency, they're going to have the court and the presidency, and they will, at worst, have a deadlock in Congress. And at best, they might have both of the bicameral seats. If that's the case, I consider that, I mean, we're, we're talking about a tremendous, tremendous threat. I think that you're dramatically downplaying both the seeming interest they have in undermining democracy and also the means that they have to achieve it, the ability. They're currently undermining longstanding constitutional precedent with Roe v. Wade. The Roe v. Wade thing is, uh, if you look at the statistics of who supports it, it's unpopular and it's probably going to hurt them in the vote. I don't think, though, that like Republicans would suddenly become a dictatorship if politically it was okay for them to do so. I think if they ever tried to do that, they would never win an election again because nobody wants a dictator. We want free and fair elections. They wouldn't now, need to win an election. Maybe that's the case, but I don't think that there's going to be a point where they're going to try to start advocating for that. Like, I don't think, you know, let's say Trump was in office and he did complete a second term, like, hypothetically. If he tries to get a third term, that's not going to end well. Everyone's going to, like, they're, they're not going to let it happen. What do you, I, I what genuinely do you, think so. What do you mean by that? So let's say, let's say that Congress is deadlocked and the Republicans have the courts and the presidency. They win in 2024. And what, what, what are you going to do? Congress can't pass anything. Um, the executive branch can do what it wants, and the, co the court, the Supreme Court, will sign off generally on Republican backed mandates. So, why could they not? Like, you know, the Weimar Republic had a constitution, right? Like, it's not as though this hasn't happened before. The idea of dictators attaining power and then operating within or flat out ignoring the pre existing liberal democratic framework. That's the normal thing that happens. That's not like the exception. That's the thing you expect to happen. What else would they do? But that's the problem, though, is you're making this extreme thing. It's like, oh, it's happened in other places. Therefore, it can happen. And guess what? It will happen. I feel like you're jumping too far on that. And I, I think the most extreme thing we're going to see is like maybe limited voter restrictions. Like, oh, you need an ID to vote. Oh, 
You know, like, I think that's probably the most extreme thing that happens that we get another four to eight years of Republican rule. I don't think we're going to get to a point where it's like, we're going to have Trump for another 12 years in office, because I think we got to that point. I think even Republicans who were Trump supporters would be like, okay, we don't live in a democracy. We're not having elections. Like, you know, I don't want to live in, like, Russia. I don't want to live in these countries where they don't have fair elections. I, I don't think... They would, that, but they would be, be told they were getting fair elections. You don't, uh, with respect, sorry, you have no fucking clue how this works. Um, we're talking about a political party that's openly signal posting its disinterest in democracy. Like the idea that after a political party attains power and becomes a dictatorship, the supporters of that political party are going to go, oh no, we want free elections. They'll think they have free elections. Supporters of Hitler thought that he had free elections. They, like they, they're not the idea that like what what you're what you're arguing right now is the concept of this kind of inherent conceptual rejection of fascism, which isn't a thing. Any government can fall, no matter how strong or how liberal or how democratic. The idea that we can't do dictatorship because even the people supporting the party currently stating they don't care for our democracy wouldn't support it if it happened is just ridiculous, and. With respect here, you know, um, I, I don't understand where this impetus comes from. I don't know if it's some liberal, like, end of history nonsense where, like, it, it can't happen here type stuff, right? You know, like, it's too extreme. It can't possibly take place here. I don't know where this drive comes from, but the, the Republican Party is explicitly announcing its anti-democratic tendencies right now. You can't talk your way around that. You can't talk your way around enabling the insurrection, backing it, defending it, claiming the election results were a fraud, uh, this, the, the civil war, like, signposting, uh, the deep state, the QAnon engagement, you can't, like, this is mainstream Republican stuff. There's no way around that. You can't, oh, you're exaggerating that. These people should be brought up on sedition trials for doing half the things that I've listed here, but they're not, and nothing happened after Jan 6 either. At least Hitler got sent to prison for a little while. Like, we, we're, in a, we're in a bad state right now. We are. I think you're giving this the most uncharitable view possible. I mean, we have four years of Trump, and people said, like, Trump's going to get elected, gay rights are going to be repealed, um, and all this stuff that just never winded up happening. Obviously, some of it did. You know, some bad stuff happened, and I think overall the Trump presidency wasn't a great presidency. Um, that being said, I do not buy this idea that Trump being elected and all these people is going to cause the end of democracy and that we're suddenly going to become just like Nazi Germany. I, th I, don't, I don't believe that. I think that's a little... <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I just, I don't buy it. I mean, like, you guys say this all the time. Lib said Roe v. Wade could get appealed. A Lib said that he wouldn't pack the courts. Lib said that they wouldn't get, like, he wouldn't get three seats on, on, the, on the Supreme Court. And, you know, Lib said he wouldn't try to get rid of um, DACA, you know? Like, Lib said he wouldn't win at all. Libs didn't, wouldn't have predicted January 6th, would they? Would you have predicted January 6th, months before it happened? Because you don't think something's going to happen, I don't need to prove that they're going to do these things. All I need to prove is that they want to. And they're telling us that they want to. And that's enough. This isn't, we're not, this isn't like a game. This is the United States of America. The Republican Party's willingness to engage with this rhetoric is sufficient for all of them to be morally deserving of being locked up in jail. We're not, we're dealing with the most powerful country on earth here. Hundreds of millions of people. I'm not going to wave away. Oh, yeah, dude, they're just memeing when they back QAnon, back the insurrection, support like attacks on the democracy, claim there's a deep state that they're fighting against and the democratic results are only a product of cheating done by the deep state. I'm not, I'm not waving this away. The fact that you would even compare that to what happened in 2016 with Hillary is ridiculous to me. I mean, all they did was point out fairly that the electoral college is... It's not, it's not only it's not the same, it's, they're not even in the same category. I mean, they're not... The Republican Party is the only party in the United States right now which holds power, which has even the slightest inclination towards anti-democratic behavior. The Democrats don't. Their prominence is, if nothing else, a, a, a forestalling effect. They have to be made powerful just to keep Republicans from succeeding in the ways that they want to. When it comes to, okay, there, there's a lot to get to. If I think there are people who they are proven to have crimes, I think that they should be put to trial and, you know, have a, a fair case shot against them. I think in all parties, in all, you know, Republicans and Democrats, if you have enough power, there are ways to get out of justice. And I think that that's a problem. So if it comes out that, yeah, these people did some stuff, I think that they should, you know, 
be punished for their crimes. I think that's a fair thing. Unfortunately, do I see that happening? No. Um, but what can we do? Uh, the point is, when it comes to the Roe v. Wade, I know what you're trying to say. Well, when it comes to that, I mean, the real reason that that happened was because there's a Republican majority of the Supreme Court now. And, you know, that would have happened with any Republican president, not even a Trump, right? We could have had a moderate you know, someone like John McCain, like, or maybe not, but, you know, like a Mitt Romney, like, like replace any Ted Cruz. This still would have happened. I don't think this is a uniquely Trump or uniquely thing. So I understand that that is one of the things that, you know, people were a little scared that what's happening. It looks like it might, uh, but maybe it's so unpopular. Maybe they're thinking that I'll lose voters from it. And that's the beautiful thing about democracy. They do something that most people think, hey, this isn't good. We vote those people out. And then over time, you know, they realize that, hey, you know, Roe v. Wade's unpopular. We got we to gotta start, you know, we got to start supporting abortion and stuff. If that happens, that's the beautiful thing about a democracy. Roe v. Wade is popular. And also, my concerns aren't with Trump. They're with the Republican Party. Ted Cruz would have done the same thing. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's just when it comes to Trump, there's this idea that, like, Trump is, like, dismantling democracy. Republicans And are. I don't... Yeah. Sure, I mean... I, that's the thing. I just, I don't believe that Republicans are like this evil group of people. I mean, these are like, most Republicans are just like, you know, your neighbors. You're just like average. Like I've talked to people who they see some of the stuff happening in the Republican party. You know, they voted for Biden or they say, you know, they can't support this. It's like, you know, I like certain things about the Republican party, but you know, they've gone a bit crazy. I mean, yet, I've seen people do the same the other side, but Trump's yeah. A, a Trump's approval rating has been unwaveringly high in the Republican Party since he burst onto the scene in 2016, though. So clearly, it's over. It's not. It's not pulling people away. He got the second highest number of votes for a presidential candidate back in 2020 under only Biden. Clearly, his behavior is popular with his base. And your argument about their nice neighbors could have literally applied to Nazi Germany. Again, like this, everyone's a nice neighbor. Everyone's nice to their neighbors, you know? We're not talking about whether they're nice to their neighbors. We're talking about whether or not they support candidates that then go on to enable bad political positions. Which you've had no answer, by the way, to like any of the anti-democratic shit that they've pushed for. Like, there's no excuse for parties to engage in it. It's not a difference in opinion. They just lied. I'm talking about Republican officials. Is there any explanation other than them being anti-democratic and evil and power hungry for them repeatedly lying over and over? Not just the, the candidates, but spreading propaganda, paying out media outlets, you know, to spread misinformation about the election to give the impression that Donald Trump actually won. The only explanation here is that they are willing to subvert democracy to attain power. And that's enough of an indictment as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so there's a few things I want to touch on. First of all, I think when you made the neighbors thing, I mean, that is like, you, you can apply that to literally anything. Like, oh, well, neighbor is nice. You know, I, he wouldn't have, you know, done this awful thing. Or I didn't think he would have, you know, you know, sexually assaulted somebody. Like, people say that, but it's like, it's different because the neighbors aren't, you know, oh, we like, you know, Nazi party. We like these policies that put millions of people in these camps that are murdered. Like, no, these are people who just like people because their taxes are lowered or they like people because you know they just have different political views that aren't as extreme as i think you're making it out trump to got be. elected or... not because of tax policy but because of his fear-mongering over illegal immigrants the idea that we should ship all the illegal immigrants back literally removing millions of people from this country and committing genocide that is a popular belief in the republican party and also, do you think that when you talked with, like, Nazi neighbors in Germany, like, they were like, ah, yes, the Jews are so bad. No, like, you just talked. They're neighbors. People are nice to their neighbors. I don't care whether the individual Republican is a good or a bad person. I only care about the outcomes that these votes, like, get put towards. Yeah. Like, you know, the Nazis probably weren't so open, but it's like, it, it's not a secret. Like, the Nazis knew what they were supporting, and it was, it's, it, I don't think it's the same. I think that's fair. Like, the Republican Party is not Nazi Germany. I, I shouldn't have to explain that, but whatever. Do they um, wait, I do they have I to literally be Nazi Germany for them to be anti-democratic and fascist? They ha I mean, maybe there are, if you, if you blink, you can see some things that are, you know, a bit, like, a bit iffy that, I, like, you know, there's a reason bit I iffy? personally am not. You have not responded to any of the anti-democratic behaviors that I've listed. I've listed them like three or four times. I, I've keep... said that I don't, I don't support it. Like, oh, you don't support that... it. Well, that's yeah, good I, to I know. Like, 
I just don't think it's as extreme as you make it out to be. But when it comes to the illegal immigration, it's like these people support illegal immigration. It's just that, you know, there are people who aren't taking the legal rights. And to be fair, there is a reason for it. We should make immigration legal and easier. I believe in that fully. I think that that's a flaw that we have. Of course, there's people who say, oh, we shouldn't have. And there's, there's racism involved in that. And I think that that's a problem. Um, I, I, there's just better ways to handle the these issues. The I think Trump did spread racist rhetoric. I will concede to that. He did. I'm glad that you disagree with their anti-democratic behavior, but I don't know how you can say I'm exaggerating when I say they're anti-democratic, when I list behaviors they've engaged in that can only be explained by them being anti-democratic. Like, it's a pretty, it's pretty one-to-one -one here. There's not really a euphemism like you can do with racism, like there's some other explanation. The only explanation about willfully lying about the results of an election for months and then essentially backing an insurrectionary attempt to engage in a coup and then only backing away from it after it became clear that the outcomes wouldn't be positive for them, and then going on to then support the perpetrators of the coup, the way that Marjorie Taylor Greene did, calling the uh, people who were imprisoned after Jan 6 political prisoners. Like, there's no explanation for this other than they're anti-democratic. I, I don't think that's an exaggeration. It's a straightforward read on their position. I think... The Republican Party is in a weird state. I think we're going to need a few more election cycles for them to find a new identity. But I do think it's clear that, you know, their behavior is unacceptable by most Americans. Obviously, there's, there's some fringes and there's some who just maybe tolerate it. Um, you know, people have different views on this. Um, but I think we're, we're going to get to a place very soon. I don't think it's going to become this extreme thing. I think they've only been getting uh, more extreme. Over since Trump, they've only well since the, um, the Tea Party they've only gotten more extreme. Like every preceding, like every successive year, all of their positions have gotten more far right. They haven't moderated at all. You could say the same thing about the left, though. You could say that like, oh, we're, we're going more left. Like, oh my God, look, we're heading, we're becoming socialists. We're becoming like, you know what I'm saying? I, I feel like no, the politics headliner, in general is getting more extreme. The headliner of the Democrats is Joe Biden, who's been in office <laughs> since the 1800s uh, and uh, was VP under Biden. The headliner of the Republicans is Trump, who is the representative of the farthest right constituents of his party outside of the actual like neo-Nazis or QAnoners, who he just tacitly supports instead of openly supporting. Um, also, when the left gets more extreme, it's towards good things. When the right gets more extreme, it's towards bad things. So I'm okay with the left getting more extreme. In fact, I want that. Yes, I, I can see that. Um, when it comes to um, Joe Biden, I think Joe Biden is a very middle of the road. I don't think anyone really loves Joe Biden. I think we merely tolerate him left and right. So I think that's cool. Um, I think Bernie, you have to think of Bernie Sanders. He was a huge thing. I mean, you know, I think the DNC did not want him to win and they really tried hard for him not to win. Um, but, they're, you know, just like Trump, we have Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is the elect equivalent of Donald Trump. Would you Except not agree Bernie with is this? good. I mean, that's obviously your opinion, but I mean, when no. we're thinking in such terms of good and bad, I mean, these, this is just like a, a trend the, going on. We're this is extreme the epitome sides. of liberal brain rot. My concern with Donald Trump isn't that he's extreme. It's that his extremism is bad. I don't care if Bernie Sanders is extreme. I don't think extremism is bad. I think Trump and the Republican Party is bad. If they were extremely pro-trans rights or extremely pro-democracy, I would be in favor of that. But they're not. They're extremely anti-democracy. So for that, like, I don't care whether or not any person or group is extreme. I love extremism. It just has to be for good things. And it is true that it's my opinion that Bernie Sanders is good. But assuming that you are pro-democracy, you should agree with me that by the metrics I'm looking at here, Bernie Sanders, who is in favor of democracy, and the Republican Party, which fights against it, are not comparable. I... There are some things you can say that they're similar, but I think a lot of them they're not. They both appeal to a certain type of voter that feels underrepresented by the current systems. And I think that they provide an interesting, like, you know, new idea for what politicians can be. But also, I think when you look at someone like Bernie Sanders, I do, I will, I will give him credit for this, right? There was a time in 2016 where the Bernie bros were demanding that, you know, he run against Trump, that he, you know, they weren't accepting the fact that Hillary won. And they had a lot of feelings about it. And Bernie stepped in and he said, no, I'm going to back, you know, Hillary Clinton. I will always give him props for that. Because it's like, while I prefer Bernie over Hillary, I never really liked Hillary. Um, I, you know, I think he would have been a better president. 
you know, there's a, a thing to be respected when someone does adhere to democracy. So I will give you credit for that. I, I mean, I think it doesn't, that that's a fair thing to say. It doesn't have to be about defending him. I'm only making the point that the Republican okay, Party yeah. is anti-democratic and has shown every sign that they're going to continue being anti-democratic. They're rolling up for 2024. It's going to be great. Well, we'll find out what happens. I just... What it, I just think a good example of this is like gerrymandering. Like people say on one side or the other, oh, this person empowers gerrymandering. They're changing the borders. And then the other side takes, you know, they have power. And all of a sudden they're gerrymandering. It's like, I think whoever is in control is going to keep in control. And yes, currently speaking, the Republicans are doing so more than the Democrats. But I think it's more of a systemic issue than let's blame this one party and call them evil. And also when you call the Republicans Democrats evil, do you're not doing a good six? job of convincing them to your side. That's fine. Did um, did Democrats do a January six and support an attack on the Capitol after Donald Trump won in twenty sixteen? No, they did. Um, okay. Obviously, did they spend I think that months the denying the results? Cool. People compare those. I don't agree. No, not comparable. Did did people? I, I literally just said that. I just okay. Said the well, I agree. Thing you said. Yeah. So do did Democrats then um, spend months lying about the results of the election after twenty sixteen and claiming that the only reason that Donald Trump won is because of an elaborate like ballot and voter fraud scheme? They didn't, but they heavily campaigned for Hillary to still get elected. I don't think it's the same, but there Wait, is some how? comparison to be made. Wait, how, how did they heavily campaign for Hillary to still get elected? What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I was seeing petitions signed. I mean, this is 20, I mean, this was so many years ago. My memory isn't the best, but I do remember petitions being like signed saying, you know, we need to get these electors to um, pledge against what they're being told. And like there were, ha there were these campaigns online. People were really Online passionate about petitions? this. I mean, there was a lot of people. I mean, it's not the same. I know it's not the same, but there was a thing, and I think it's a precursor to what we're experiencing now because petitions. people did not want Trump in office. There are online so. petitions to everything. That's not a precursor. There are no, online I, I petitions to know, literally I know. everything. I'm just, I, Trump's behavior was backed I mean, by the party. There were probably protests. There were probably like, like I said, it's not the same, but there were... But then I mean, why do you keep trying to equivocate movement. the Democratic Party, which isn't anti-democratic, to the Republican Party, which is? Because there isn't a comparison it was the, here. It was the first sign. I mean, we didn't have this kind of stuff. I mean, maybe a little bit when Obama was elected. Or, but, like, we didn't... This is kind of unusual what's happening recently. And I think the 2016 was, like, a sign that we were headed in this direction with the division from that election. I mean, we can't deny that that was one of the most divisive crazy times in politics people being yeah. ass mad about their preferred candidate not winning has been a thing for as long as democracy has existed the idea of the entire political party spending months working in tandem with their media to propagate the idea that the election was stolen from them is an entirely different thing that's a whole new thing and they like haven't said, even given it up I think most people are over it now. I, I, I think, I mean, there's like some fringe people who are like, yeah, you know, I think most, if you talk to most conservatives, I think they'll be like, they've kind of accepted Joe Biden. They've, toler they've tolerated him like we all have. Um, I think tens of millions of Republicans believe that Trump won in 2020. Um, a poll done on September 12th, 2021, says 59% um, of GOP voters say believing trump won 2020 is important to being a republican um two-thirds of republicans still think the 2020 election yeah it's like somewhere between 50 percent to the majority of republicans believe that donald trump was had the election stolen from them that's too many you don't need a hundred million people to win a coup having tens of millions of rabid dedicated uh you know disinfo believing voters supporting you in critical places while you take over a government is more than enough i think i think that's a fair point to make i think we have a problem i just don't think it's as extreme as you make it out to be and i just i hear you say a lot of like really like crazy big statements like there's just going to be this awful thing happening like i, I feel like there's a lot of fear mongering and it, it just i don't i don't feel like it's warranted i think if you look at the news like yeah oh you know you can point to these certain things happening yeah this is a bit scary you know this isn't but we'll, we're gonna be okay democracy's not going anywhere this is like it's good. you're like you're first to die you know that right 
Like this attitude of complacency. <laughs> no, the genocide's coming. I'm being locked up in a camp. Oh no. No, like, in, I, no. In this, in this worried, case, it would be. I should be worried more than anybody. If I'm not worried, what does that say? It would be like, your. I, I, it would. It would say you're you naive. You're the first to go. In. It has nothing to do with your identity. It's because you're naive. This, like, like, what is this? I've listed so many ways in which they're openly anti-democratic, and you're like, haha, it won't be that bad. It can't happen here. Like, with respect, that's what they thought back in the Weimar Republic. That's what they always think. Everyone always thinks that. You believe so you live at the end of history. So why is there a fascist revolution in every single country? Like, you could say that about you literally every liberal country that ever exists. You like, realize liberal democracies are outnumbered by countries that aren't liberal democracies, and that right now there are fewer liberal democracies than there have been, than there were 20 years ago, right? Like Hungary? Remember what happened there? Everyone said it couldn't happen there either, and then it did. Like, the, the liberal democracies are the exception, not the rule. Uh, uh, Russia fell, uh, Russian adjacent post-Soviet nations that didn't align with the EU. You have a brief span of potential liberal democracy before post-Soviet corruption sets in. The idea that it can't, Turkey? Yeah, the idea that it can't happen here is gigacopium. And the, and this, and, and it goes beyond gigacopium to being irresponsible when you're like responding to legitimate signs of a potential future, like autocratic coup being done by the party, which has already attempted an autocratic coup by saying like, oh, you're fear mongering, you know, you're crazy. I don't think I'm crazy. I think the Republicans are just being honest when they show us who they are. I, th I think you're scared and I understand why you're scared. Um, but like I said, you know, as someone who has Please a lot don't of stake try in, to patronize. in this. What? Please don't patronize. It's not about personal fear. I'm rich. I can move to okay. any country on earth. That wasn't like an insult. Like I was trying to empathize with you, but okay. Uh, I just think that we have strong systems in place, and I'm I'm confident enough in the democracy of this country that I'm okay. Can it happen? Yeah, it technically could happen anywhere. I'm not denying. Like, yeah, is there a small chance that something can happen? Yeah, okay. Could a meteor strike an Earth? Like, yeah. I mean, obviously, so you know, one you think the likelihood like of a meteor no, striking not, the Earth? The no, okay, no, no. the I, Republican I, I was just Party. About to say that. No, I don't think it's the same thing. I is anti-democratic in ways that you don't have a counter for. Why would you not think an anti? So. If a racist party achieves power, you think there might be racist outcomes. If a homophobic party achieves power, you think there might be homophobic outcomes. If an anti-democratic party achieves power, you think there might be anti-democratic outcomes, right? Like, isn't that a reasonable... All I'm doing is looking at their behavior and going, hey, they might continue to do the things they're already doing. I'm not extrapolating. Like, they're already saying they're anti-democratic. The problem with having anti-democratic politicians, though, is that if they get what they want done, you don't get another shot. The elections are done, or at least heavily biased in their favor. It's just, I mean, like I said, I just have to go back. I mean, when Trump was in power, I was scared. I had that point in my life. I was terrified. I had just come out as trans. You know, I was pretty young, and I was like, oh, no, what does this mean for me? Am I not going to be able to transition and stuff? And, you know, I had that fear. And I think because I had that fear for so long and I turned out okay at the end, I think that's probably why I feel the way that I do. How old are you? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm 22. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I fucking thought so. With respect, like, this is the consequence of people who only got into politics in 2016. You think the world began when you started paying attention to politics in 2016? And um, since, like, you got all the apocalyptic messaging back in 2016 and then it happened, like, it finished? and like Biden came into president, you're like, oh, okay, so it will be okay. They're, you're engaging in the same logical fallacy that people do when they think that climate change isn't actually a problem because they were warned about it in the year of 2000 by Al Gore, and he said that by like 2015, things would be like this, and they're not that bad yet. So you're like, oh, so there's no issue. Like climate change is still coming. The timeline just isn't what we thought it was going to be. And Republicans are still coming, you know? That timeline, nobody predicts, nobody can know the future, but that doesn't mean the threat has gone away. It just means it's deferred. Like the beer hall push. When when did the beer hall push happen? What was it? Beer hall push. Nineteen twenty three. And when did when did Hitler take power? Yeah. A wacky guy. A decade afterwards. You know what a what a comfortable decade that must have been. How much people may have laughed at him. Oh Hitler. Oh the Nazis. You mean that the guy associated with the, you know, the party associated with that guy who got arrested after the beer hall put, you know? And then, where do we end up? I'm not saying Trump's like Hitler. I'm just saying that, like, don't, okay. po politics doesn't operate on the time scale that your personal sense of comfort and relief does.
Um, I think that that's probably a very, a very fair point. Um, I would say when it comes to climate change, I think you mentioned, I think that climate change, like, is happening the way scientists like said it would happen. I think it's actually a little faster than they said. The problem is with something that is like so far in the future that, I mean, we had like a lot of extreme, like messaging saying like, you know, all of these crazy things, all of this like, you know, extremist stuff. And some of it is happening. It's just not happening right away. It's taking decades to, you know, notice things happening. And it's like these smaller things that eventually lead to these bigger things. Um, a lot of drastic stuff is changing, but because it's like the average American's life isn't really changing that much, people don't think it's a substantial threat, when in reality, it is a more long-lasting threat. Obviously, politics isn't the same. Like, you'll have, like, you know, a bunch of very normal democracy, and then you'll have, like, these weird, you know, climates where, you know, some extremists take power. I mean, you know, a lot of people were saying, like, Trump is the most extreme president we've had in a long time, and, you know, even then, we were fine. Could we have someone who was more, could this lead to the way to more... I guess there's always a possibility. There always is. Um, but like I said, I just, I, I don't see that happening. I think as a society, I, I'm very happy with the way that like, you know, people are, I think people are more moderate. I mean, well, not more moderate. I think people aren't as extreme. I don't think that the public is really going to, you know, vote for someone who is super like extreme on the right. I don't think that that is very popular with the American people. But I they think we're did. We're becoming more progressive as a society. But, but they did do. I that. don't think Trump would win if we if we did an election right now. I do not think Trump would win. I mean, maybe it's possible that he would. He came close in 2020, and he had more votes for him than any other candidate in U.S. history, apart from Biden, in that same election. I mean. He lost. He won in 2016. He lost in 2020. I mean, okay. that's all I really have to I, say. So I know that he lost, but my threshold for believing we've overcome the specter of far-right anti-democracy is not they lost an election one time, which again, There's... they did. The Nazis, they did. It doesn't matter whether or not they win or lose one time. They only have to win once, and they're positioned pretty well for 2024. Well, we'll see what happens. I mean, Trump did win once. And yeah, you say we only need once. He won once. And we got someone like Biden now. Very calm, very, I want to say uneventful, but I don't think it's entirely uneventful. Um, but compared to Trump, I mean, Trump was a very interesting figure. What has Trump like, done in the past four years? Has he moderated in response to this voter pressure for him to become more moderate? Or has he only been more extreme with time? It's not like he didn't do work back during his first presidency, you know. The first presidency, he spent the entire time radicalizing his base. Republicans, over the course of just a few years, went from the John McCain era of complacent neocon, uh, you know, um, cuck republic republicans to being like mm. epic red pill Donald Trump like proto fascists who are basically believe in QAnon and think that like the whole country is falling apart and can only be saved by a strong man. It took him that you know, long to move tens of millions of Americans over to his standard. You know what? I'll, I'll tell you, I think you do have a point. And I'll concede in some way because there, there's an event that will always stick in my mind. Um, there's this guy, Dan Crenshaw. He was housing a debate at my college. And I'll never forget this. Um, Nick Fluentes and a bunch of his fans like randomly stored this random debate. And they asked the like, conservative guy all these anti-Jewish questions. It was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. And I was just watching it live, like, in front of my face. And these people were, like, saying the most, like, awful, nasty shit. And these were Republicans who were so extreme that someone like Dan Crenshaw was basically, like, a liberal to them. Like, they didn't... It, it was... That was probably the thing that scared me the most in my life. That was a very weird thing to be a part of. Um, so I do think that they there are dead. these... I... I... <laughs> <laughs> they want me dead. I mean, I don't know if they, I don't know if they want me dead. I think that's a very extreme thing to say. Like, even if these people have political power, I don't think that they're going to go all Nazi and like lock me up in a camp somewhere. Why not? I, I think it'd be, I would be very scared. I would probably consider moving to another country if like someone like Nick Fuentes rose to power. It'd be pretty scary time. Now, even if the, but the I mainstream... don't, I don't think that they'd murder me though. The I, mainstream I really Republican don't. Party on a state level has already supported a variety of positions depending on who we're talking about. Everything from forced detransition to denying medical coverage to trans adults yeah. um, to uh, banning the discussion of any trans issues in schooling to the idea of forced um, 
uh, uh, conversion therapy to the idea of uh, arresting parents of trans children because they believe the trans child must have been groomed by the parents. The combined effect That's of all this behavior, close. they want to legislate you out of existence. There are, I will say this right now, there are a lot of anti-trans laws being passed. It is a very sad thing. I think we need to fight against them. I was in a class recently, I'll never forget this, and like the teacher was mentioning this, and it's like, you know, everyone at first was like, oh, this is so sad, these anti-trans laws. And then we went to what these laws actually were, and it was like one of the laws was like trans people can't play in sports. And they were actually like, oh, this is act actually, this isn't that bad. I actually agree with this law. And I was thinking to myself like, no, you're not supposed to agree with it. It's like you, that's the problem though, is they're phrasing it in a way that it's like the don't say gay bill, like in Florida, people are phrasing it to make it look like how how could you be against a bill that's like what do you, are you saying that we want teachers to like talk about sex with third graders it's like they're very manipulative in how they talk about it they don't understand that these people are just trying to like make it harder for lgbt people and as much as they get away with they just i agree again, they're, they it's almost it like they lie yeah. to get away with hurting people as badly as possible while not tripping any of the legal or civil barriers that they would need to in order to achieve their real goals because they lie anyway. I mean, you're completely right. The don't say gay bill is being framed as some kind of protect our children from pointless discourse. But in reality, and it's pretty widely acknowledged, at least in liberal circles, that the don't say gay bill is incredibly legally irresponsible and just basically make, like prevents teachers from even acknowledging the existence of anything that isn't like cishet, you know, people in classes. So if they're willing to lie about that, and for what? Like, do you really think these legislators believe that, like, this is about protecting children? They want to make you illegal. And maybe step one is these, you know, is this wave of, of anti-trans legislation and, you know, somewhat reasonable sounding stuff like the don't let trans women play in women's sports bill or whatever, you know. But if they gain more power, um, one of the first things that far-right governments typically do to consolidate their power is to blame the perceived downfall of their society on a minority group, external and internal, because mm. galvanizing hate against that group is more effective in terms of PR response than focusing on the achievements of the party itself. And trans people right now are lined up as basically the Jews of modern America. You're an... Oh. No, really? You're in effect? No, I'm saying that that's awful. I hate it. When I'm oh, yeah. That, I'm just like, I hate that for myself. It's like, why? I hate that I'm like the fucking boogeyman of America. It's like, like wow, in effect, I love debating my existence with people. I'm not talking about you. Left, no, no, I get it. No, left-leaning, yeah. effect, intellectual, degenerate, um... Uh, seducing youth, corrupting children, like the, the stereotypes in terms of how they're applied line up pretty heavily. And it's like, damn, you know, I don't know. I, um, I mean, you know, dispense with the Nazi Germany comparisons and all. I think some of them would put you in camps. Yeah, I do. I do. I think that I think those neighbors that treat you so nice, you know, if you gave them the right political conditions 10 or 15 years down the road, would be reporting you to the local bureau because you're a suspected child groomer and they would be they would be sending you mm -hmm. off to a for, uh, forced uh, 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 conversion therapy. You know, this isn't unprecedented civilly. It's not like this has only oh. ever happened in Nazi Germany. I just don't want this to happen to happen either and that's the problem i think we want the same thing i just that's the thing is i'm nice to people i'm nice to conservatives and they're nice to me i've had so many positive experiences in my life through relatives who people would say oh they're they're like these awful people they'll never like you but because i was nice to them they liked me and oh, it was always. like we were cool they were better about trans rights because i was nice because i understood them and because i was reasonable and that's why i feel like i am the way i am because i've seen it firsthand I think if we, there's so much divisiveness, but if we just like talk to people and be like, hey, I'm just like a woman. I don't want to like, you know, remove gender roles. I'm not trying to erase gender, all these things that people are saying. I just want to exist in society as a woman and for it not to be a huge deal. There, I mean, it. there are conservatives <laughs> who will shit talk BLM and say George Floyd is two years off his fentanyl addiction or whatever, but they'll have like black coworkers that they talk nice with, you know? There are plenty of anti-feminists and anti-women's rights advocates who have good relationships with individual women in their lives. The, like, there's a difference between individual decorum and like political advocacy. And at the end of the day, like people being nice to you in person can never be a good metric for their political positions generally, because you'll always be one of the good ones. 
Like, that's always how it is. Like, they'll always be, okay, yeah, I have a problem with immigrants in general, but, like, you're one of the good ones. Oh, trans people in general are crazy, but you're one of the good ones. It'll always be like that. So, while kindness is a good virtue in general, I still think it's important as a, um, as a broad approach to, to treat these people as the political enemy. Because even if they're kind in direct conversation, their kindness, the kindness they have with you, you're kind of letting them off the hook. If a person who wants to legislate you out of existence has friendly convos with you, what does that make them feel like, you know? Oh, they're Christ-like. They can get along. They don't, they don't hate the sinner. They hate the sin. But no, that's not enough, right? They should face political opposition. They should face stigmatization. Um, we should make life bad for them because they're trying to make life bad for others. I mean, the issue here is when it comes to trans people, there's just not a lot of us out there. I mean, online is different. I mean, you know, a lot of trans people online, but you know, I think, I don't quote me on this, but I remember seeing somewhere that only like 30% of people know a trans person. I was surprised it was like even that high, like in real life, you know? Most, most people haven't met a trans person. Like all we're seeing is like trans people in the media. And when you see trans people in the media, it's usually not great representation. Yeah. So I think it's always good to be a positive role model because I could be super, you know, argumentative and be like, oh, how dare you vote for Trump? How dare you? But like, what is that going to do? It's just going to make me the enemy and it's not going to get me anywhere with these people. Instead, if I'm nice to them, it's like, hey, I disagree with you politically, but like, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not what you think I am. I'm just like pretty chill. Oh, I'm, I think I'm nice when I talk to conservatives. More. I'm nice when I talk to conservatives in person, you know, um, but there's a middle ground. You don't have to freak out and yell at them for voting for Trump or whatever, but I think you gotta, you gotta stand your ground like it's a law, you know, and you can't ever delude yourself into thinking that because they're nice individually, that means their political aspirations aren't malicious. The more extreme ends, maybe. I think even the moderate conservative does have transphobic feelings. Like even the moderate liberal probably has transphobic feelings, right? I mean, there, you know, I was debated Destiny recently. I'm sure, you know, there are some Destiny viewers who aren't transphobic. I'm sure there are some who are. Maybe some of your viewers are transphobic, but I think you're very anti, um, what is it? You're, you're very pro-trans, um, but I'm sure, you know, there's, I just think in society, unfortunately speaking, you pull 10 people on the street, I think seven of them are probably going to have some very iffy views on trans people, and two of them of the non, like two of the other three, are like gonna say that they're pro-trans, but they're not super pro-trans. Like we're very far from where we need to be, and that's the problem. I is it's such that. a new thing? Yeah. No, and I, that, I and agree. That's what with it that. sucks having to live that. And it's like most people I talk to, they're gonna be like, "Oh yeah, they're not gonna say something to my face, but they, they might feel some way." And it's like, yeah, you can say, "Oh, this is Republicans," and maybe there's more Republicans than Democrats. But I've had Democrats say super transphobic stuff to me. Like if I don't agree with them politically, like you know, on the abortion thing or anything, I've had like feminists say to me oh, well, you you know, only, like, you're not a real woman, like, I forget what they said, but they said some, like, not, like, as soon as I disagree with them politically, like, their true nature comes out, and they'll say, well, actually, your thing doesn't matter because you're not a real woman anyway, and I was just like, oh, so that's how you really feel, like, oh, oh my god, and so then I, I see stuff like that, and I'm thinking, like, okay, this is, just, like, just as bad as what the Republicans are saying to me, like, I, I don't, I don't understand, Wait, maybe. It's, it's not about which individual's support which positions it's about which political forces they back and at the end of the day the republican party right now is embroiled in a massive anti-trans wave of propaganda and legislation and the democrats aren't i acknowledge that there are plenty of phony progressives out there and plenty of republicans who are capable of being nice interpersonally with trans people but i feel like it's important to look beyond people's individual levels of civil you know decorum and and focus on what matters most, which is ultimately, you know, after all the civility is set aside and the decorum is put away, what do people vote for? What actual political positions do people support? And I would always rather have a trans folk voting blue than a, um, you know, a person who considers themselves an egalitarian voting red, because that's the outcome that actually is going to have an effect on my life. Maybe. Um, I would say that the culture is important because, I mean, when you talk about, like, you know, if I, there's a bunch of, like, let's say there's a bunch of, and there are a bunch of, like, Turks. They're liberals, but they hate trans people. You know, daily life is still going to be really hard for, you know, me because of all these turf types out there. But it, it, it's like, oh, but they're technically voting for the left, you know? So I guess, like, you know, certain things, like, 
But I well, you can be comfy to them if you want. To... I'm not. I'm not defending these people. You can treat. You can treat them like shit for all I care. I mean, I want to be respectful. I had someone I was going to talk to a bit, and then kind of it didn't wind up happening because he. It was so weird because this person was like nice to me, and then like the next day he's like retweeting all these like turf articles, and it, it just is so weird. It's like I want to be nice to people, and it, it, that's the thing I'm struggling with. It's like people who are starting to like you know fall for this transphobic propaganda and stuff. It's like I, I want to be nice to them, but maybe that's like not always gonna work and like how do i deal with that i just it's like I, I i don't i don't believe like oh just give up don't care what they think I, like there's always an effort to be made it's just ugh. i don't it think sucks. there's a relationship at all between how nice people are in person and what their actual political positions are i think there are plenty like we, right after the civil rights movement, it became politically unacceptable for white people to call black people the N-word with the hard R, you know, for mm -hmm. a variety of reasons. And in, But all those people who used to do that day to day, they're still politicians. They're still deans. They're still principals. They're still bosses. So what they have to learn to get real nice with people they do not like, people who spent the past 30 years of their career advocating that white people and black people li should live separately, all of a sudden have to buddy-buddy in a society where it's not acceptable to say that. I think that people can have a pretty deliberate and well-learned response for civility, even with groups of people they hate. And I think that's one of the reasons conservatives have a huge uh, chip on the shoulder, because they feel like they're a victim for having to do that, because they hate these people and they think everyone else does too. And they feel like they're being like, ba like basically forced by society to suppress those feelings and act insincerely. And they consider that to be a form of oppression. And I really feel like the only way to get past that, like, because you'll never know if a person is being nice to you is doing so sincerely or not. The only way to really get past that, I think, um, is to just deal with the cultural forces that make these people prominent to begin with. And there's no denying that right now, the reason conservatives have a chip on their shoulder about trans people is because they're being told to by conservative media and conservative politicians <laughs> for no reason. Like, nothing was happening, and then conservatives just decided uh, in 2017 with the anti-trans bathroom bill, banning trans people from the military despite the Pentagon recommendation, mm -hmm. all the conservative obsession with drag queen time story hour, the the current... Well, I don't like drag queen story hour, but otherwise I agree with you. Well, right, but it's uh, it's not an indictment of trans people in general. Drag queens aren't even trans necessarily. Um, yeah, 100%. I'm anti-drag queen, but I agree with you with everything else. It all gets roped in. And they're... Yeah, sure. Right. That's and right. yeah. And so I think like we have to, we have to cut the, um, we have to cut the head off. You know what I mean? We got to lop them. Uh, and the best way to do that, I think, is to promote uh, aggressive anti-Republican political advocacy. Um, here's the thing though. I want, I want to get back to something you said. Um, I mean, we, we've mentioned this before. I mean, when you talk to, you know, conservatives, they'll be nice to you in front of your face and that there's a big power when they can do that, but in, in the back of their head, they still have these racist, these homophobic, these sexist, these transphobic thoughts. I do think that that's true to some extent. The issue is like, I've seen it with liberals too. It's just, I think it manifests in different ways. And I think in some instances, maybe there's more, like maybe liberals feel such a pressure to be pro-trans when it's like, uh, actually, no, I just support abortions. I mean, I just support like, you know, better workers conditions. I'm not really with this, I just want gay rights. I'm not, I'm not you know, the trans stuff is too far for me. Them. But I want to be nice. I think that that's like way too common within the within liberals and stuff. I mean, the liberals. And so it's like I I feel that coming from both sides. And I, I'm I'm just going to be honest with you. I I think Republicans are upfront about it, but I think the Democratic can be just as malicious. They're also the ones legislating. I don't accept this equivocacy. Regardless of your personal experiences, all polling and all legislative like records indicate that Republicans are far, far more anti-LGBT than Democrats are. Maybe you've like experienced disingenuous like liberals or whatever, but to be honest, mm -hmm. I don't know where your political instincts are, but a lot of people call themselves liberals when they're not. Sargon called himself a liberal, you know? I, like, I don't know. Turfs call themselves liberals. And then like J.K. Rowling pretends well, to be a liberal are, and exclusively backs and like talks with and hangs out with like conservatives now. So, uh, but like, do, you, oh, you, sorry, can, no, you, you can be mean to whoever you want. All I'm saying is that at the end of the day, like, we know which side of the aisle is, um, is anti-trans based on polling and based on um, what legislation they're pushing. I think, generally speaking, you are correct in that, generally speaking, Republicans are much more anti-trans. I think that's just pretty much a fact. Um, but I, I think it goes deeper than that. I will say, though, I do, when, when it comes to turfs, I think that there are a lot of turfs do 
I, I've noticed this, and they do have a lot of like Republican tendencies when it comes to their anti-trans stuff. I have noticed that. I think that there is a point there. But you have these people who are pro-choice, they're feminists, they're pro-gay. I mean, all of these things, but they're anti-trans. I think they are liberals. And I think when people say, oh, they're all conservatives, I think you're just dismissing the problem. You're kind of sweeping under the rug. Because it's so often to say, turfs are just, uh, they're, they're just conservatives. So don't worry about it. But I don't think that they're just conservatives. I think a lot of them are liberals. Maybe they want to, some of them want to seem like liberals, but they're more conservative than they're letting on. I don't know J.K. Rowling's, you know, her stance on every issue. Um, but she does have some liberal issues. And I do think that, you know, she's a liberal on a lot of stuff and a lot of Turks are. So right. I think that this is a problem that's going on. I think there are a lot of people on the left who are anti-trans, but they're still, you know, pro these other things. No, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I just don't think that there's an equivocacy when it comes to which side you should support politically. But I acknowledge that there are plenty of liberals. I feel like I'm talking to a liberal right now who has like bigoted Fred elections, you know? It, it's, it's been known to happen. Um, sorry, I should clarify that because I didn't mean that as underhandedly as I'm sure it sounded. I was joking mostly. Um, though I am kind of curious about your drag queen statement earlier. Uh, the, yeah, uh, but no, in, in terms of like a lot of people identify as, as liberals. I, I don't really care for that. All I care about is like politically what outcomes are we getting with this party versus the other republicans are the ones doing the huge anti-trans legislation wave and pushing the anti-trans propaganda and when you see liberals who believe anti-trans sentiments they probably got it from conservative media you know like these moderate liberals who are so concerned about trans women and women's sports or about trans women being groomers or about them being delusional or mentally ill it's not left-leaning media that's pushing that idea it's right-leaning media that they might have picked up on definitely the tucker carlson's and the ben shapiro's in the world definitely oh yeah no i'm not even denying that that is just that is true um the only issue though is like i think the vast majority of trans people are voting like democratic like that is just a thing that happens i'm probably in the minority for even being slightly center of like right of left you know what i'm saying um but what i i think the, a good comparison we could make is there's like you know there's black and hispanic voters who you know you know they believe in these conservative values but because republicans are racist they're gonna vote for the left so i mean i think that could be an issue too it's like i you know i'm not just a trans woman like obviously i don't i don't even know where i stand politically like i i don't I wouldn't even call myself a centrist, honestly. I just, I don't know where I fit in. Because I don't think any party really speaks to me. And I haven't found my place yet. Um, I just know that I feel like there's like this, like, even my mom says to me sometimes, like, she'll be like, you know, that these Republicans, they're trying to take away your rights. And it's like, I know when it comes to trans stuff, the liberals are always going to, you know, be pro-trans in that instance. But maybe there's some other stuff that I don't agree with, like, I don't feel like I have, I, it feels wrong that I have to be locked into the certain stance, that I have to always feel a certain way when it's like, I don't want to be defined by like one issue, but when it's my rights on the line, it's important. It's just this weird tug of war. I don't know how to feel. You could always it's, be a socialist it's and a lot. Uh, break the line. <laughs> I, I don't know if I, I mentioned this. I think I did in the email. I'm like half Cuban. Um, my mom... Her parents uh, escaped um, from Cuba when Fidel rose to power. So I don't think I'll ever fall in line. I do. Here's the thing, though. I think when it comes to like what we actually believe, I kind of believe in a lot of the same stuff. I think that minimum wage needs to be increased. I think workers deserve more rights. So you think, oh, well, you do think, no, I'm not a socialist. I do believe that like capitalism should still exist. I think you know businesses shouldn't go away. I think that there's a lot of regulations that need to be put on businesses so that they act better and that, you know, the average American lives a better life. But I, I don't call myself a socialist because I think that that's just capitalism done better. So, I, you know what I'm saying? And I like, don't uh, want to, like, like Cuba super is really capitalism, bad. I don't perhaps? want America to ever become like that. Uh, super capitalism, perhaps? I'm a big fan of super capitalism. Well, I, what I'm saying is that the way that capitalism being, is being run is a huge problem because... You know, a lot of average Americans are suffering while these CEOs are, like, profiting and they're, like, super greedy. And it's, like, it's not working. And the average American doesn't have a say. You know, there's lobbyists all over the place. We have all of these problems that need to be fixed, but I don't believe the answer to that. And I think the problem is we have these genuine problems that people are looking at. And because of these problems, they're turning to socialism 
because it's so bad, they think that capitalism is the problem, we need to throw it away. When I think the reality is we need a better form. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't think you'd agree. Oh, no, really? no, no. Yeah. I think one of the most important things that we can do to improve capitalism uh, is to really double down on the incentive structure of production and innovation that makes capitalism so valuable. I think one of the best things we can do to achieve this is to ensure that every business is owned collectively by the workers who um, produce there. Because that way, all of the workers have a collective incentive to maximize the effectiveness of their business. Super capitalism. <laughs> okay, so I feel like that's the thing that I think you're trying to trick me into, like, the workers, the means. I think you're trying to trick me into some Marxist stuff. No, I, no, I just, no, 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 no. I, I want to <laughs> know what you mean when you say that, though, because we have to... I think we're fighting a fine line of like, you know, there's a certain point. It's like, I don't think the CEO should be making the exact same as the average worker, but I don't think the average worker should be making ten dollars an hour. I think they need to be making a living wage. Um, I think I think there's a fine line in between that where you can find a beautiful harmony that works. Well, of course, I am a socialist, which means that the ideal society, or at least the society that I would like to work towards, you know, it's always more complicated than that is one where um, the commodity form has been abolished. That is to say, goods are no longer produced for the purpose of selling them. And additionally, where <laughs> you have a democratization of the means of production. So the means of production are controlled collectively by the people, or by the working class. Um, and I think one of the most effective ways to move in that direction is to push for a worker cooperative economy, which is generally referred to as market socialism, though there's a bit more to it than that. Um, and I think that would be one of the steps that we could take. Uh, not all worker cooperatives are flat in terms of their pay, like everyone gets paid the same, but the most essential feature is that there is a democratic structure within the company. Most companies are autocratic by nature. Um, you know, you, you don't really have a way of second guessing or checking what the boss does or says. So a worker cooperative allows for some level of democracy, whether that be voting on issues or voting in managers. Okay, I do think that workers should probably have more say in their place. I think, you know, there should they should have more say than they currently get. I don't think they should have all the say. I do think that there, you know, there's upper management roles for a reason, but they, they should have more say than they currently do. I think that that is a problem and that is a thing that is happening. And when it comes to selling goods, though, I think people, you know, if you say, oh, well, no one's doing it for profit, I think that, you know, when people sell things for profit, they're basically giving people more of what they want. So, you know, these you, people say that these companies are so evil, but it's like, the problem is because they're making money, the fact that they're making money incentivizes them to make the things that people want. And it incentivizes people to be like, oh, I'm going to make this thing that, you know, every, it's going to benefit people's lives. This is going to make me rich as well. I think it's a mutual benefit in this case. And well, I think there are, there are goods to capitalism. There's also bads to capitalism and we have to regulate those so that, you know, it's more tolerable. Well, they're not giving anyone, anyone anything, right? They're selling. But it really depends on the market we're talking about, right? So when we talk about decommodification, there are things in America that are already decommodified to an extent. Um, in some cities, there's decommodified transport and travel where it's managed by the city. Um, there are uh, countries where decommodified housing initiatives exist. Um, medical care uh, decommodified to an extent when you have Medicaid, to the extent at least the government is capturing a portion uh, of its of its interests. Um, I think that when we talk about decommodification, the first things we need to work on decommodifying are elements of industry where the supply demand curve doesn't function that well. Because oftentimes it's more profitable to do something that's just worse socially, and there's also not really a need for consumer choice. For example, medical care. Consumer choice doesn't exist for medical care the same way it does for other things, because nobody goes shopping around for like a, a, a surgery to have done on them. Emergency services are done at the closest hospital to you because that is where you need to go immediately. And usually you're just looking for some very basic medical supervision over some issue that you have to get a prescription. But it's not like you don't like shop around hospital to hospital for the most part, usually because hospitals don't have to make their prices public. So decommodification can be effective there. Housing industry. Um, you have massive housing crises in large cities because um, the state or the uh, local government is preventing companies from building out more housing because housing realtors uh, uh, want to keep the relative price of high, uh, houses high so they can sell them at a higher price. And um, existing homeowners don't want the 
uh, you know, evaluation of their housing price to go down by the existence of new houses to be built. So, like, you have instances where the supply-demand shit just doesn't work that well. You have inelastic markets. So we can test decommodification there. Other countries already have. It's been effective. Um, you know, and, and I think that's a good way to start in that direction. I'm okay with an incremental approach towards these things, insofar as it gives us data to work with. Okay. Oh, wow. There's a lot I need to cover. I've been writing down these notes. Um, I would say, okay, where do I even start? Um, when it comes to these medical things specifically, right? I want to mention a, a personal story I have, right? I have relatives in Cuba. I have relatives in Cuba who has cancer, and my mom literally had to fly to Cuba to get the medicine from the United States because even though their health care was free, they didn't have really good health care. And that's the issue. It's like they didn't have these drugs that we needed to save her life. So, you know, all the time people say, and the U.S. medical system is not perfect. You know, it's a problem. A lot of people who are poor can't afford medical care and they die. And that's an awful thing that should not be happening in the first world country. But there, at the same time, you have to acknowledge that, you know, there are people coming from other countries. And I've, a lot of these countries, you know, they have these long lines. I've even heard of cases where it's like people are assigned a doctor and it's like, this is, you know, your free doctor, but this is the doctor you get. And it might not be the best doctor. Um, but Americans, you know, you have to pay more, but there's a choice. And I, I always get the assumption, if you're rich in this country, it's better. But if you're poor in this country, it's worse. So it's like, there, it's, it's probably worse for most people, but, but it's, when it's good, it's really good. So, I mean, I, I don't know how I feel about that. You but don't I, choose. I think there's some positive. The, you, the, you don't choose. The insurance chooses, right? Also, the reason they had to go to America to get that drug is probably because of the U.S. embargo on Cuba. Cuba has really good medical outcomes, but you can't really blame it for not having, a, like, some types of drugs because the country is not wealthy enough to have the massive pharmaceutical companies America has. If it weren't for the embargo, they could probably just buy the drugs. For the, for the amount of money Cuba has, their medical outcomes are astonishingly high. Um, you, you know, um, if it weren't for the embargo, they probably would be wealthier and would probably have access to better medicine as well. But there, there are so many doctors there that they export them, which is pretty crazy. Um, in terms of, like, choice, I don't think the average American, like, really chooses anything meaningful about their health care, you know? Or, mm -hmm. like, the choice we're getting is superficial. People care about, like, keeping their doctor. But, like, what most people need for their medical checkups is, like, regular checkups, urgent care, emergency care. Emergency care, nobody gets a choice. You get shunted off to the nearest emergency care, usually. Urgent care, you just have, like, an issue that you need taken care of. You don't really even need, like, your doctor. You can just get anyone to look at it, usually. Um, and then for general checkups, like, it's like a once-a-year thing, you know? Most people, like... I just, I feel like a lot of people pay like fucking billions of dollars on their medical care and they barely get anything in return for it. Even people who have medical insurance pay out the ass for it and they often can't even choose the hospitals they want because insurance doesn't cover all hospitals always or not all hospitals take all insurance. And then the pricing, they still kick in after and then you have to meet the fucking minimum before the insurance kicks in. It's a fucking, it's a nightmare, you know? This is a system where decommodification is just perfect. Standardized care. Um, get rid of the insurance system um, because it's non-elastic. There's no limit to what a person will pay for insulin, which means that there's no limit that a company's willing to charge for it, theoretically, outside external factors. Because um, you can't just not have insulin, right? You, you, you absolutely, you need to have insulin, and that's a problem. Like, you had Martin Screlly, like raising the price all the time. People are like praising him. It's like, no, this dude did an awful thing. Yeah, it, these life-saving drugs are so vital and so important. They shouldn't be bankrupting people. I think that that's a fair thing. You know, I think most people would agree. Welcome Maybe to socialism. You're, uh, you're no longer allowed to vote and you have to buy a gun. Uh, you know, uh, no, Kalashnikov style, that. nice, uh, nice uh, wooden stock with a strap over it. Um, uh, come, welcome to the club. No, I, the problem is that you have these companies artificially raising the prices over because they know that people are so desperate that they'll pay it. It's like, it does not cost that much for these companies to make these drugs, but they're making it cost more because they're greedy and they know they can get away with it. I think that's the problem. I don't think it's socialism. I think make them more affordable so that they don't make people break the bank. I think there's a problem with hospitals. I was just reading it just recently that like hospitals will overcharge you like, just add bills because, like, they just get away with it. Like, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. 
And it's like that, in my opinion, the solution to that is regulate those companies and nobody's doing it. And it's Super like, capitalism, why? I agree. But that that's the thing. I think that we fundamentally disagree. It's like, I think you see that and you say, throw it all away. When I say, I think that it means we need more regulations to make the system better. Well, the problems that exist in the medical industry are a very visible facsimile of issues that exist broadly in our economy, especially in markets which should be decommodified. Housing is in a similar situation. Right now in the United States, the aggregate, what is the median rent in the United States? Isn't it some, it's like nearing 2,000 or something, but the median income in the U.S. is something like 50 or 60,000, which means that the, um, like the, the, the proportion you're supposed to spend a third of your income or less on rent, like the proportion, mm -hmm. it's getting to the point like Americans can't afford rent in America. And that's the free market at work right there. The free market and local governments work together to restrict uh, access to housing supply. And our government allows uh, foreign investors to, or, or local investors, it really doesn't matter, to buy up real estate and just sit in it as an investment, you know, to speculate on it rather than to have anyone actually live in there. This can be addressed with policy. Um, but one of the best policies that we could go for, in my personal opinion, is to decommodify the housing market, which has seen limited success in parts of America and in parts of other countries, to have local initiatives to build out additional housing, uh, which are being done exclusively for the betterment of the city and not being done for the, um, you know, for, for the, the profit seeking of the construction companies and realtors. Well, also, um, I live in Phoenix and Phoenix is, oh, I think, sorry. the city that's... No, yeah, that's what I'm saying. We are most impacted by all of this. I think we're like the number one most like house prices going up, right? I've lived here for a long time. It used to be pretty cheap, pretty affordable to live here. These past two years, though, lots of people, I can't explain to you why. It's hot as fuck in Phoenix. Sorry if I'm not allowed to curse. I think I'm okay. Um, but yeah, it's really hot. Don't know why anyone's living here, but a lot of people from California and stuff want to move here. And the problem is these past few years, housing prices have nearly doubled. It's absolutely insane. And I don't know, like, this used to be an affordable place to live for a lot of people. And I'm seeing firsthand that it's not. And it's, it's a problem. We could literally just is, build houses. We could just build them. We could just do I, that. Yeah, we should. But uh, here's the thing, though. People, they're not building houses. They're building apartments. They want people to live in apartments. And they're charging, like, just as much, if not more. Some of their apartment rates are insane. It's like, you're not even getting a full house. You're getting, like, a one bedroom where you live with, like, a thousand other people. It's like, it's so crazy what they're trying to make you do. It's like, you can't even have your own land at this point. You need to have someone who owns the apartment and they're profiting from it. I don't like apartments. I think that's something we can agree with conservatives well, on too, because I think they like houses. They no, like the no, dream no. of owning a house. Oh, you're not going to get me on this one. One of the big reasons housing prices are so high is because huge areas of cities are zoned exclusively for single family houses, which are very space inefficient and very costly for the city because it means laying out way more underlying infrastructure, sewage, water lines, uh, electricity, stuff like that. Um, that's why suburbs are so incredibly expensive. Suburbs are almost always a net tax loss. For the city because it's so expensive to maintain them um i'm in favor of the construction of apartments i just i think the issue right now is that the balancing is off there are families that are too poor to afford a house so they cram together into apartments but like the apartment should be for bachelors apartments should be for bachelors or single like people or couples or students or whatever like stuff like that you know uh, older people if they want, but like if a family wants to be able to get into a larger home, they should be able to, but they can't because for, in a lot of places, the bigger home is all that exists. So it's very space inefficient and you have like a much lower, um, like population per square mile than you could get otherwise. For a perfect example of this, look in um, Los Angeles. Oh my God, Los Angeles, the county is like 13 million people in it. And there are just entire square miles of Los Angeles where you can drive around in very poor areas, by the way, and see nothing but like single family houses with single ha family lots with tiny houses on them built for poor people in areas where the realtors wanted to build apartments because it would be more space and cost efficient, but they couldn't because the zoning laws only allow them to build single family houses. So they just have tiny little houses squatting on these huge lots that just die because the families don't have the money or interest to maintain the lot of a house they can like barely afford, you know? Like it's, it's so fucked, you know? Sorry, I'm rambling. You're totally fine. I think with Los Angeles, I think in particular, that city is so big and there's so many people that live there. I think that that's a 
pretty different situation. You have, you know, there's not a lot of space. So in that instance, you probably do need apartments. Like New York City, you can't have single family houses in New York City and Manhattan. That just, that's not a thing that can happen. You need those high rises. Um, but when it comes to like Phoenix, for instance, where I live at least, right? There's a lot of empty land. There's a lot of like, you know, so we, we don't have a ton of, I mean, we, we have more apartments now probably because there's more people. Um, but for me, or at least my own experience, single family homes have always worked. And, you know, for most Americans, they have worked. I, I think, you know, in like the 50s or whatever, it was expected that people would live in homes. And I worry that this trend is now. It didn't work economically. They don't expect, it was, they it was don't bad. Expect Why was it bad? Well, Because those suburbs didn't work. Like, economically, they were a terrible idea. They ended up being a huge, huge, huge money sink. The best money, like, sources for a city, it's always the inner urban area. I think you can get, like, something with the, with the dignity of a single-family house without all the wasteful suburban space. Um, Medium-density suburbs, which you can find, I think, around Chicago. Um, uh, uh, well, you can find them everywhere, but I think that uh, Chicago has a pretty good example of them. Um, you can find these places where, um, where, where, where things are pretty packed together, but it like feels good to live in. Let me see if I can find a good example of this. Um, there's a particular city that was used in a Just Not Bikes episode, or Not Just Bikes episode. Oh, here mm -hmm. we go. Okay, I don't know why, I don't know why this photo is so blown out. Let me see if I can find a better one. Okay, like, mm -hmm. like this. So, this is, <laughs> this is in Ukraine, but this is the type of development that I'm talking about. I'll send you a link. So, you have single family um, houses, but not standard American single family zoning, where you have houses that are put very close together and you don't have lawns because lawns are dumb and gay. And um, there you go. I really like development oh, like yeah. this. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna. Yeah, because it gives people. That's good. Yeah, that's good. It, it gives people the dignity of um, of like um, y y you know. Close together, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're, like, screaming, maybe, like, the people next door will hear you or whatever. But if you yeah. want to live in a city, there, there, there have to be consequences, you know? And the issue, pretty. Yeah, I think so. And then the issue is, like, the suburbs that I take an issue with are shit like this, you know, where... Oh. <laughs> not just the uniformity, but, like, can I get, like, an up-close picture for the sake of my stream? Yeah, that, look, that looks more like where I grew up, like, just houses like that. <laughs> Yeah, one of the big issues is lawns, too. Like, lawns are just a net drain on everything because they take a ton of water to maintain. Nobody likes or cares about them, especially not in suburban areas. Nobody gives a shit about their lawn. And it doubles the size of the lot without adding any economic value to the property, meaning that the relative, like, tax valuation of the land doesn't scale in proportion, you know? So it's... So, anyway, I, don't get me wrong. I think that's fair. Yeah, I'm in favor of single-family housing as long as it's done well, I guess. That's my... Yeah, sorry. I'm, again, I'm rambling. No, that is, that is a perfectly good I'm point. Autistic I think single family. Nah, you're good. Uh, single-family houses are the American dream. Like, people do want that. Like, and that's the problem with the financial situation that we're currently in. Oh, hold on. Um, hopefully my audio is still working. It got um, a little bit zoopy for a second, but it sorry. happens. Yeah. Okay. Uh -oh. they they die sometimes but i'm good i'm good um so with the single family homes the issue is that they're becoming more afford unaffordable like inflation housing prices and i just you know i fear about that but i do i think if we build smartly if we start doing those things then maybe it'll help and maybe the zoning laws maybe that is an issue maybe it is a problem but um it, i think it's just about building it smartly and i think these are conversations that we do need to have so no yeah, yeah. i agree um, but there are, for, there are a ton of industries where I feel like decommodification could be an effective solution to some like levels there, but it's also a very granular conversation. The thing I care most about is the worker democracy, which you agreed to in principle, which I appreciate, you know, not to say mm -hmm. that that's you conceding to the glory of, you know, the socialist, the, you know, the, the entirety of the thing, but, um, the idea of like, because I, I think it's very, very agreeable in principle, you know, um, we live in a democratic country for now. Uh, so I, I guess it would be my hope that the major institutions that we, we spend our lives beholden to would still be democratic, you know. Even our local DMV is democratic by proxy because it's downstream government policy, which we do impact with our elections. Not very substantively, but still. But companies, not so much. You know, you work there because you need the pay and you have no say. So hopefully that's something that gets more manageable with time, but I don't know. Wait, one last thing, by the way, as long as we're yeah, on, yeah. okay? 
how do you feel how do you feel about townhouses i'm um i'm a big i'm a big townhouse fan in concept where basically just like the the close together single family homes except instead of um instead of like building out wide you build tall most of them are like three stories tall with um with like uh, four or five built to a block i've seen i've seen positive stuff about that i know people like them i here this is going to sound really weird i wouldn't want to live in one myself but i can understand why people like them now my experience is this i actually lived in a townhouse for a little bit um, my parents did a downsizing at one point in time. It didn't work out. Um, thankfully, we don't live in a townhouse anymore. But we did it at the time, and I just didn't like it. You could hear the neighbors through your walls. It wasn't ideal, and it was like basically all the basically all the stuff of apartment living. It felt weird to have other people basically like live in your house, but it's not your house. The houses were just so close together, and it was just it, it wasn't. It wasn't great, but it's like it's better than apartments. So I think if that's more affordable and it makes housing prices cheaper, then it's like if we look at a pure economic state, then maybe that does lead to a higher standard of living. If we're talking in that instance, maybe they are good. But I, all I know is that I, I personally do not like townhouses. I wouldn't want to live in one. But if it creates a higher standard of living for people who otherwise would be able to afford a house and they can afford a townhouse instead. I think that's undeniably better i think it's like a sense it's like a medium thing i think the, okay. the rate with townhouses i just linked you another this is the most common type of prefab townhousing in seattle which is like mm. now seattle has its own housing issues but in concept you can get on, on, on a space that has the same lot size as a medium-sized single-family home you can get like three how townhouses that have the same mm. interior floor space as like a mission style one floor single family home um albeit with a lot more exercise because you have to walk up and down stairs a lot and um, i think these are pretty cool if that if that's the case and building those makes it cheaper and more affordable for these families and they get a higher standard of living than otherwise then i think that that's obviously a good thing yeah. like if we're, if we're looking at that from that side yeah in socialist america well god willing oh sorry okay i got I, I, it's been a while since I've gotten stunlocked while in a conversation with another person. Um, what do you we're, mean stunlocked? We're at, oh, like, like distracted. Um, we're actually okay. running pretty close to the end of stream, and I told my chat that I would read donos before I ended. Um, I didn't realize it had been 90 minutes already. Was there anything else that you had in your mind, like another big subject that you wanted to discuss? Um, honestly, I'm really pleased with how this conversation went. I think we covered a lot of ground and I'm actually very happy. I wasn't sure what to expect going in. You know, there's always, there's always nerves when you, you know, on a big stream like this. Um, but yeah, I, I think I covered pretty much what I wanted to cover. I think we had a really I, I interesting actually, conversation. I did really, oh, my cat jumped up. I, um, I did really enjoy the conversation. I, um, I, I am curious and chatted as well. What's your opposition to, uh, to drag? Oh, I, I had a, I think I briefly mentioned this my debate with destiny last month um so my idea is as a trans woman i feel like it's like mocking me and i worry that like people look at drag queens and they see trans women it like spreads negative ideas of trans people and it's like i just i feel like i'm being mocked like when you have a man who identifies as a man you know wearing a dress or like putting on this exaggerated makeup it, it it just feels like it's it's insulting me. I'm just, I just want to be seen as a normal woman. Like this isn't my community. I don't. I mean, it it, go, it runs deep. Do you think? And it's like. Do you think a little bit's like a projected dysphoria thing a bit, where like you there's like an innate discomfort with what feels like a pantomiming of something that you authentically have adopted. So when when you see that, it, it you you feel like you're being kind of implicated. You know, I've, I've heard this before. A lot of people said to me, I've, I've heard this exact argument before. Oh, you just hate yourself. Like, you're, you're just... No, no, no. I don't, I don't think that means you hate yourself oh, or anything. Sorry, I just mean, sorry. like, it, like an, an extension of experiences that you had have probably made you, like, defensive about what you perceive to be, like, a, a, a component of, like, you know, caricature of a woman arguments, right? Like, if a trans woman has spent a good chunk of her life trying very much to mm -hmm. avoid being accused of being a man... I can imagine that, like, there might be some innate sense of discomfort around drag. Like, I, I do get that. Oh, not, definitely, yeah. yeah. 
And it's like, I, I worry because it's like so often in these like trans spaces, it's like such an unpopular opinion. Like, I feel like I can't just say that out loud. Cause it's like, oh, but these, these people are part of your community. And it's like, I don't think that they are though. Like, I mean, they, these people often use like, you know, slurs, like the, I guess I can say them cause I'm trans. I just don't like saying these words at all, but I'll say them just so you know what I'm saying. Like, I mean, we're talking the T slur and like the she male, I, I fucking hate those words, but those are like popular within the, like the drag community. I, I, you know, the way that they like over exaggerate stuff. I've just, it makes me feel very uncomfortable because it's like all my life, like, like you said, you know, I've just been wanting to see as a normal woman and that just like flies in the face of that. And also goes to the part of, you know, they're trying to erase gender. They're trying to remove gender roles. And it's like, I'm just trying to be normal. Because people look at that and they see that's what LGBT is, or that's what I'm, I just want to be accepted in society. These people are promoting, like, and that's the thing. That's what they, that's what most people think that trans people are. And it bothers me. It bothers me that people think that trans people are like that, because we're not. It bothers me they have these misconceptions. And I think that drag being existing and the way that it is, I think it promotes that. To be fair, you can't really defer to hegemonic gender norms by calling yourself normal. You're transgender. To a person who doesn't accept your identity, they would make the same arguments about you being a subversive attack on gender roles that you would make against trans people. Or sorry, not trans people, drag queens. You're just, you know, one step, for, you're like one rung further up the ladder, basically. I, I, I absolutely hate being compared to drag queens. I just, I don't like it. It's so different to what I am. And I think it's, it's kind of insulting to say, well, you're not that far removed from a man in a dress, you know. It's in like, the sense, to me, that, that just feels like, I don't like that. Well, trans people and drag queens are undeniably subversions of traditional gender values. Um, and in, in the sense that your criticism of drag queens is, I just want to be normal, you know, you can't be normal if normal is being defined by normal gender standards, right? You kind of got denied that chance early on in life. You can be but cool. I can, I can uphold female traditional gender standards. That's fine. But you're doing so as, do. a, as a trans person. And again, that's not a normative statement on my part. Obviously, this is a pro-trans community. But no. I just think that a deference towards normality is, well, in your case, it's conditional, you know? I don't think normality is an inherently virtuous thing. You want to represent womanhood in a traditional and, you know, um, what would you say, a, he a hegemonic standard fashion? And I think that's perfectly fine, but I don't think it would be fair then for you to turn around and go like, well, I'm not abnormal like those people, right? Because, you know, in this case, abnormal is very much a gradient upon which you both exist. That doesn't mean you're the same as a man who dresses as a woman, not by any means. It just means that you're both deviations from, like, hegemonic gender roles. Oh, I don't believe that I differ from, like, gender roles. Like, that's the, it feels weird to put someone in the box. It's like, oh, because you're a trans woman, you'll never be normal. You'll never fit in. You're just going to be an outcast your whole life, no matter how hard you I don't you think try. that. Like, but you're, I don't think you have to be an outcast or that you'll never fit in. But if normal is defined as stereotypical gender roles, then that is true. I don't think you can be that while being trans because you're trans. But that's not an insult. And that doesn't if mean I, you're the same I, as everyone else who defies gender roles. But I don't believe that I do. I don't defy. I, if I'm just a woman who like passes and I just, I'm out there, everyone sees a woman and no one knows that I'm trans except for me. That's not defying anything. Um, I'm not challenging anything. A, I'm just existing. A cis man me. who wears women's lingerie underneath his clothing uh, is not perceived by others to be anything other than normal. But that is still oh a God. quiet defiance of gender roles, is it not? That's different. That is a someone who identifies as a man wearing it. I don't like the fact that I'm being compared to someone who is like identifies as a man. I'm we're, just a woman. We're it's only not talking. You are a woman. We're only talking yeah, know, about I'm just defiance saying. of gender roles here. Oh, yeah, you could say like, oh, you know, me being the woman. I think that's what you're trying to say. The fact that I transition at all. Is yeah, yes, you're you're the woman. But, but, but you're, okay. you're, I think yeah. that's what you're trying to say. Yeah. Well, you're a, it's not, it's nothing to do with you not being a woman. Um, it has to do with just the standards pertaining to cis versus trans people always having normativity hinged towards being cis. In the future, that might change. Maybe being trans is, um, you know, 
going to be so common that us sissies will be the weird ones. Nah, but... that'll never happen. Oh, maybe. Okay, my cat is biting my pants. Is there something you want? Can I can I help you? Here, I'm just, wait. Okay. Weirdo. Um, oh my god. Anyway, no, it's 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 not about comparing you to drag or anything else. It's just that I don't like like deference to normality because any argument you make about how drag queens aren't normal or whatever is an argument other people can make with the same standards against you only because to them you are also not normal because you are trans but that's the problem the problem is that we're being even seen in the same conversation when we shouldn't be this is like i don't believe that we're in the same ballpark or in the same spectrum or in the same thing and i think the fact that you see it that way and that a lot of people see it that way is the problem like I, yeah, there's a fact that, oh, at some point in time, me choosing to transition, you know, deviated what from people expected from me. Um, but what I actually perform and what I actually am does conform into what society says a woman should be. So, and I am a woman. I just am. You are? Of course you're a woman. Nobody oh, hears... And I, and I know. I know, you know. I know what we're trying to say. Right. It's, just, yeah. it's, it's not... It's only in the category of, of defiance of gender expectations. Normal attitudes towards gender mean women are born women and men are born men. Anyone who believes that that's not the case, you know, uh, is to some extent abnormal. And standards are changing here. I just don't think it's you, you can ever make an argument against normality as a person who already defies normality in some other respect, because you're kind of implicating yourself. I mean, you have to know the vast majority of people who would criticize drag for being abnormal would criticize you for being abnormal. Um, even I've seen if a they're... lot of transphobic people who love drag. I see a lot of turfs who love drag. I'm just, I've seen it. A lot I'm, of writers who love I feel there are, I, I'm, I'm sure that the drag community is on average quite a bit more, um, well, turfs hate drag because turfs hate what they perceive to be caricatures of femininity. Um, there are definitely transphobes who like drag. I don't deny that. It's probably a more pro-trans like community than what you're going to find pretty much anywhere else, right? Even RuPaul yeah. has had um, trans oh, drag... He's transphobic, yeah. RuPaul has absolutely done and said transphobic stuff. I don't know anything about what he's up to now, but I do know that the drag race, the show, has trans queens or kings? I don't... Ha has trans people trans perform. Though. I don't think that's good for the mental health. What if they want like, to? I think it's really fucked up that our society, it's more acceptable to be seen as a man who dresses up as a woman for laughter and for fun for the audience than to actually just be a woman in current society. I don't think that that's a good thing. And I think the fact that trans people are feeling more accepted there than other places says a lot of problems within our society. Well, some, some trans people, I think, just like the idea of gender expression being considered more fluid and more open and more expressive. And they want an escape from years and years of like hegemonic and oppressive standards for what they're allowed to do, say, present as, dress as, whatever else. Um, but I don't think, it's not a competition. Like, say drag queens are more accepted than trans people, and even then, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I don't have any data on that. But it, say they were. Like, what's the competition? We should fight for acceptance for both groups, no? I said, I just, I think that drag goes against what I stand for, but I know what you're, I know what you're trying to say. Don't you love freedom? Um, I... I do. It's like, I'm not going to go up to someone's face and be like, you stop doing that. That's not my, that's not what I'm going for. But I'm not going to lie and say that it doesn't bother me. Right? I, I'll be upfront about that. And I feel like a lot of people, I mean, maybe I'm a lot of us, who knows? I just, I've seen too many people say to me like, oh, well, you know, this drag queen, she's prettier than you. And you actually like try, isn't it? So like, I've seen people who are transphobic, they throw that in their face and it's just so seen it so much and the problem with trans people who do drag is that when you're doing drag you have to understand you're not being seen as a trans woman when you're doing a your drag performance you are being seen as a man in a dress and if you're a trans person that's never a good place to be i'll never understand a trans woman maybe if they're early in the transition they're still but even then i just feel like that automatically should make you dysphoric I, mean, I mean, that's, that's it up to own, them. This is a me thing, probably. Uh, I, I'd, I'd say probably. I mean, they know what they're getting into, right? I think, I don't, the drag, look, I'm not into drag at all. I don't know, like, people, it's this whole, like, well, they're a queen when they're up there, but not when they're not. I don't know what the standards are for trans drag queens. It probably depends on 
which one if you ask them or whatever. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if they like what they're doing, they're getting into. Drag queens are like a very small portion of the population. Um, you know, they're like we're we're like trans people are like what maybe one to two percent or something, maybe if extrapolated broadly. But um, if with with drag queens, it's it's kind of like a it's like an it's like an identity that's also kind of a profession a little bit. So it's it's a it's a much more niche thing. I don't know. It seems to me like any arguments against them on the basis of normality can be applied pretty broadly, which would be bad for a lot of people. Um, and that maybe there are some negative externalities, but like that's up to them, right? You know, like for them to manage. I mean, I, if someone's early in their transition, I want them to do what's happy. I just, I, I said this before, I do not think that doing drive is good for a trans person to do. I think there's better ways to express yourself that don't, you know, have society viewing you as a man in a dress and treating you like a man in a dress. I think there's ways to express yourself that, you know, it doesn't. And the problem with this culture, when you normalize stuff like that, is you have a, you know, let's say you have a trans woman who transitions late in life, you know, it doesn't have the luxuries that I had, you know, it doesn't have supportive parents and all that stuff. Transitions later in life, wears a dress in public, you have these very well meaning people who then misgender her or they think that, you know, she's a drag queen or they think that she's all this other stuff. And that's the problem. Well, that's like, up, I, just wanna... I mean, that's up to them, right? You can't limit the expression of queer people because you're afraid they individually might get blowback for it. Um, I'm... Right. I, mean... I just want to live in a world where like trans, I don't want to live in any else. Look, first of all, that, that's not what I'm saying. I just, I want to acknowledge this. If this is a thing because it, it bothers me. I want to live in a world where trans women who maybe don't have the luxuries to pass can wear a dress in public and like will automatically be she heard just for the fact of wearing a dress. And there's not like these weird they them politics or there's not these weird, oh, you know, you're a ma you're so brave for being a man wearing a dress. Like, no, you're, you're wearing a dress in public. Clearly, you identify it as a woman. Like, I, I just want to what live if, in that world where it's like a, person... a trans woman. What if a person yeah. really is just a man in a dress in public, though? Maybe that exists. I think it's rare, and I, I think... I've heard this before. If you're a man in a dress... I think I had a debate with someone I think was brought up, and if you're a man in a dress and you get she heard, it's not going to bother you. Would that be Probably. By extension, that trans women who are wearing jeans would be he-himmed, because jeans are historically masculine uh, clothing? A lot of women wear jeans. It's, it's not the same thing. Uh, if it was a tuxedo, maybe. Um, but I, I don't think that that's like nearly the same. Well, what clothes would, would trans women have to wear dresses twenty four seven then to get appropriately gendered? No, not that's not. I just think that like if you wear a dress, like that is a clear sign that you are acting or you want to be seen as feminine. If you're a cis man who wears a dress. You know, maybe that's a sign that, like, hey, you know, if you want people to see you as a man, you shouldn't be wearing a dress. If that is your intention to be seen as a man by society, wearing a dress does not sound like the smartest idea. Well, I think that that's a fair you... thing to say. I'm not, I'm not saying that no one ever, under any circumstances, should not be allowed to do it. I just think, I think it's fair. You know? uh, yeah, I generally agree. People who wear dresses are going to be, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're signaling at least something closer to womanhood there. Um, I feel like the goal, though, should be to get rid of these standards, because these are the standards that you spent your life fighting against, right? Like, if we're talking, I don't, I don't think you're ever going to have a society that will effortlessly correctly gender a trans woman when identified, but will also think it's weird and aberrant when a man is seen wearing a dress. I think those are mutually exclusive, and it might be the reason why you don't like drag either. You want to be trans and to live in a world where you're treated as a woman, which is great but you also want an upholding of traditional gender roles, at least the non-coercive sense. Yeah. You want them to be standardized and maintained. So what essentially you want is very selective gender liberation. And I think it's kind of an all or nothing yeah. package. I mean, like I said, that's why I feel so isolated from a lot of other trans people, because that's just, to me, it makes a lot of sense. But when I explain it to other people, it's like it's become known to me over time that oh this is this is literally just a me thing but in like in in my understanding it, it like makes so much sense it's like i just 
it's so weird because like people look at me and they think I have all these like expectations for tearing down gender. And that's, I think what you're implying there when it's like, I do think that it's important to have clothing that is like the fine, like if you wear this, you know, you know, this is a exclusively female clothing. Like you wear this, oh, people will see you as a woman for wearing this. I think that's important because gender expression is important. And I don't like this idea, like, because when you take that away, everyone wears the same bland uniform people are only looking at biology at that point. And that's not, as a trans woman, that's not what I want. I don't want to, you know, everyone wears the same bland clothing and then people just refer to you based on how you look based on your biological sex. I think that's the opposite of what I want. Maybe I'm thinking too much. Maybe I'm, I'm like way too into deep this because again, it's, maybe it's just a me thing. I but think I just that, worry. Uh, I worry about it. That's all. I think a gender abolitionist society would be more accepting of trans people than you think it would. I think that in some ways, but I think it'd be in the, like the Twitter who, you know, the Twitter version of transness, which is not the best version. I'm not entirely I think it's sure the version what that, that means. steers people away. You know what I'm saying? The people, there's, there's some cringy people on Twitter. You're not that. Well, hold on. Wait, you're, you're a liberal. Okay. You don't get to talk about other people being cringe. Um, I mean, all I of you, all ways. of you have I'm, been I'm struck by the cringe bat. All right. And frankly, as a cisgender person uh, who has been secure in his cisgender identity for his entire life, um, all you trans people are cringier than me. Your path of self-discovery, your journey to actualize, involves way more awkward bullshit than I will ever have to deal with. So none of you get any, none of you get to talk down on any of the rest of you, okay? <laughs> Only I get to do that. Um, the, 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 the the with with regards to the like you know twitter trans or whatever i mean they're just more liberal than you on this they don't just want to succeed as a trans person within the system they want to break down the system that was preventing them from succeeding on their own terms and i can't blame them for that you know um there are legitimate issues real harmful coercive effects to the way we treat people uh with regards to their gender or sex or whatever and you know i think um i think it's valid to want to approach those just keep in mind that all this is a long-term thing right like i'm a gender abolitionist but i still identify and present as a man pretty much uniformly um i don't think like we're it's going to be like you know next year biden's going to drop with the uh you know the the femboyification gas and everyone's going to have to wear cat ears or whatever <laughs> I just, it has, the, all of this, all the people on Twitter, it has implications for how it affects me. It has implications for how people see trans people. When I see someone who is a femboy who identifies with she, they, and they pronouns, that does not represent me. I, that does not represent what I'm going for. I, I don't believe not trying in that. To, I believe though. in he, she, and they. But, yeah, but they could say people, the same about you. You don't represent what they're going for. They would probably find your advocacy to be reactionary. So you could both <laughs> say that about each other. And you know what? That's fair. Um, you know, I know that there's a lot of trans people that don't like, you know, my opinions. And that's totally understandable. You know, we can agree to disagree. But I think in a lot of instances, I mean, obviously, you read Billy White's, and I don't think I'm as extreme as her. I think she's a lot more extreme than me in a lot of cases. I don't agree with her in a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm like not in either, really. But I think there's a lot more people online advocating for the femboy, she, they, they, or maybe not that extreme, but you know what I mean. Like, there's a lot more people on that side of the spectrum than where I stand. Just keep and in I mind. And I feel like I want, I want people, oh, I want to be more palatable to the right. Is you, that bad? If you <laughs> want to, sure, but you'll, yeah. be, you'll be free to, even if they're free to do what they want. And keep in mind that a hundred years ago, you just said women wear jeans. A hundred years ago, women wearing jeans would have also been considered a radical and subversive deviation of traditional gender norms. You know, there were suffragettes back mm -hmm. in those days who were like, listen, I just want women to have the right to vote. I don't think we should be like wearing pants or being the uh, primary breadwinner of the house. The line always moves eventually. And even in our lifetimes, you know, people go outside in anime t-shirts these days. I say people <laughs> as though I don't. That wasn't happening back in the 90s. I mean, not outside an incredibly niche, marginal group of people. Um, all overall, our standards for what is or is not acceptable to do, say, or present as have, like, changed tremendously. Um, even in our own lifetimes. Uh, even your young age of 22, there's been a difference. I'm sure you know. 
between now and a decade mm -hmm. ago. So the line yeah. moves whether we like it to or not. I'm generally in favor of freedom and free expression. So if people want to be able to dress however, I think that's nice. I like decoupling expression from identity in large part because I feel people who are willing to accept expression as a proxy for identity but not identity itself don't have a very strong ideological basis for supporting trans people. Or to put it another way, somebody who would look at you like wearing jeans and a t-shirt and he him you but then look at you in a dress and she her you probably isn't somebody who's like a reliable advocate for your identity as a woman right even if they're looking at like presentation as a proxy would you want them assuming he him if they just saw you in like gender neutral clothing oh. like jeans and a hoodie it, no, so, no. Yeah. I, I have long hair. I mean, I'm very feminized. If I wear, I'm not going to wear gender neutral. I mean, I wear, I only shop from like female clothing, but I can understand that some people it looks neutral, maybe. I don't know. What if you had, like, what if you had short hair, though? Like, there are cis women with short hair. It's more popular now than it has been in ages. I mean, I'm sure they exist. I think most trans women, though, if they want to be feminine, like, that's, that's an easy way to help your case to have long hair. I'm not saying you have to. I just think it's better if you're a trans woman and you want to be seen as a woman. It's better to have long hair. I think it makes it, it, makes it easier. But we're talking ideals here, right? Follow through with me here. You know, let's say you have short hair. I have, no, by the way, no clue what you look like. You know, we're not making any judgments about how you look at all. But let's say you've got short hair and you're wearing a uh, boy mode clothing. You know, you got a black hoodie and black jeans on, whatever. You know, it's you're, you're rushing out to rent some videotapes from Blockbuster. Okay. And. <laughs> You get he hemmed by a cashier, you know, errantly the fool, and you correct them and say she her. Now, do you want the response from that person to be, oh, well, then why'd you cut your hair short or something like that? To, it, to, to me, to my mind, the, 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 the sinister nature of the expression equals identity or assumes identity is that you're failing your identity by not expressing um, in that direction. But there are cisgender women who look like butch lesbians, right? Some of them look like men, despite being cis women, because um, of how they dress and present and, you know, so on. So I feel like that's an unreliable metric for validating identity, because then you're at fault if you get misgendered, right? Like, oh, well, maybe you should have had little pink bows in your hair. Oh, maybe you should have worn a little pretty princess tutu dress, you know? Then it's on you. And at that point, like, we're not really talking about trans liberation. We're talking about shackling you to a a hyperbole of femininity in order for you to be accepted and that to me sounds exhausting well i will say women with short hair first of all i mean there's a lot of things i have to say i've been writing stuff down uh they're not exactly trying to act super feminine i think the women who have short hair are much more in the camp of not in a spectrum they're closer to gender abolitionism than the average person maybe not fully there uh, maybe they're turfy who knows um, but like I said, when I'm talking about like this thing that I said with dresses, I'm only talking about like the most extreme examples. Like if someone's just wearing a basic t-shirt and jeans, like that is so gender neutral. And that is like the majority of what people wear, right? When I'm talking about a dress, that's obviously an example, like a dress or a skirt. That is like the extreme. That's really all I'm talking about. It's, it's not, it, it might sound like a, a lot, but it, it's not really. Um, I just, I like that people, you know, have that option if they're struggling to pass or, you know, they just want to, they want it to be known. They want the world to know that they're trying to express as a woman. They have, they can do that and that people are just going to, yeah, or that, you know, they get the chance to look pretty and all that. But also, do you think yeah, it's their I do, fault? Um, I don't think it's their fault necessarily, but I do think that there are things they can do to help them. And if we want the best for these people, we can say, hey, you know, it sucks that society's this way, but... There are things you can do to help your case. I agree that if a trans woman wants to be gendered correctly, there are definitely ways that she can present to increase the likelihood of that being the case. But there's a difference between the descriptive and the prescriptive there. The descriptive is anybody is going to be more likely to be treated as a woman if they wear super feminine clothing and pre present super feminine or whatever. But in a prescriptive sense, I don't think we should be saying that they ought to do that for any reason other than their own good, you know? Like, it's not their responsibility to do that. The trans women should be accepted as women no matter how they present. You should never get the response of like, oh, well, if you wanted to be treated as a woman, you should have worn more feminine clothing. I just think that, I'm not saying that anyone like has to, I just think you should be encouraged to, and I think it's for your own self-interest to do so. I'm not saying you have to, I'm just saying that, you know, if you want to be seen a certain way, 
these are things that can help you. And I don't, I think it should be encouraged. That's all I'm saying. And by the way, just, I'm going to touch back to a thing you said. I do agree with you to an extent that, you know, clothing in a sense can be socially constructed, right? You go to history, there are, there are like presidents that like their kids and you see their child photos and they're, they're like wearing a dress and you're like, what the fuck, why are they wearing a dress? And it's like boys wearing dresses. Apparently that was a thing back in the day or like heels were originally invented for men. All, all these things that I've, I've been told before. It's like, okay, yeah, maybe there's some socially constructed thing. Okay, I, obviously I'm heavily attached to what it is now because I'm born the time that I'm in. So I can't imagine those things, you know, being male. But I like I like the social constructs the way they are now. They're, yeah, they are social constructs, like the way that people dress. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But I do think it's important to have a distinction, to have something that is male and something that is female for the reasons that I said before. That, that's just how I feel. We're coming for your gender roles. Uh, we're going to break them. They're already breaking, you know. The line is getting blurrier. I don't know if you're much of a Tinderite yourself, but... All you have to do is go swiping through a major metropolitan area in the United States, and I swear to God, half these people are non-binary. Absolutely insane. Uh, um, the, t- the future looks Sorry. bright. I, I think Tinder, I don't know if you know this, um, Tinder is pretty a uh, transphobic app. If you go on Tinder and you label yourself as a transgender woman, and you're like, you, you put yourself as a woman, a lot of men will report you on the app, and if you get a lot of reports, they'll just automatically ban you. So, like, trans women will go on Tinder, and they will get automatically banned for simply putting that they're a trans woman in their bio. Oh, yeah, it's super fucked. I totally it's, agree. I mean, so, like, obviously, you have, and there's another issue with society, you have, like, AFAB people assigned female at birth putting non-binary, and they have these straight men on these apps who basically just see them as women, and, you know, they don't, they don't fully understand it. They're just, like, they don't care. And it's, it's just kind of, like, weird, too. Like, that is definitely a thing that happens. So, like, when you're talking about that, it's, like, these... It's it's weird, and it's, that's the whole thing that I'm not really qualified to totally get into. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't shock me that that is a thing that's happening. I think and why they I think are not the non- the trans women are. I think the non-binary stuff. Well, I think people discriminate more against binary trans people than non-binary people in some mm-hmm. respects, depending on their perceived presentation. If you have a feminine person who's AFAB, who presents as non-binary, they're probably not going to have much trouble hooking up with guys who are straight, because at the end of the day, sexuality and gender don't map onto each other perfectly, right? Like, there are straight guys who would rail the fuck out of femboys, you know, life is complicated, what are you gonna do? Um, the, um... What is your straight, but whatever. I'm sorry? <laughs> If you like femboys, you're not straight, but whatever. <laughs> well, I'd say there are people who are in their entire lives exclusively interested in women who would want to rail the fuck out of femboys. What, regardless of how people want to go about defining, you know, sexuality or what have you, um, which is not something I can settle here. Uh, yeah, I don't know. They, people are getting more free-flowing with time on, on stuff like this. I think it's generally a good thing. Um, You know, the difficulties that you've gone through growing up as a trans person, I think, are going to be alleviated significantly in a world where people have less strong opinions on what men and women ought to be. You know, a world where people have strong opinions that women ought wear these clothing, ought dress this way, present this way, and men, so on and so forth, are probably going to have stronger institutional and cultural barriers to trans people being accepted than if people have just kind of this laissez-faire attitude, which is what I prefer. Um... I don't think there have been any negative externalities to that laissez-faire attitude just yet. Uh, I mean, like I said, I just, it's not the direction I want to see. It, it seems like it's the direction that's going to win the cultural war, and that's where we're going to be 10, 20 years from now. And I'll let you know if I think society's better. I think society overall will get better for trans people. And by the way, just, just want to bring it back to that. You say that you think society is going to get better for trans people. That means that the Republicans aren't going to win and cause a genocide against trans people. It really just depends saying. on uh, really hey, depends hey, on hey, whether I'm or not uh, they win. You know? Yeah. I do. You know what? Well, I do think that uh, r- life will get better for trans people because we'll be successful. We'll fight back. Okay. We'll do. Or we'll do our Katniss Everdeen revolution against the uh, Republican coup, just goes and we'll institute the first thirty minutes. That's all I'm saying. Uh, we'll, we'll institute a, you know, a, a trans unionist empire. Um, I actually, I really have enjoyed the conversation. Can I, uh, you know, I, I, I have to ask, are you at all familiar with ContraPoints? Yeah, I, I am. I, I like her stuff. I mean, you know, there's some stuff I disagree with her. I don't think she should be canceled. I think the people trying to cancel her are weird. 
don't agree with her fully with everything she says. She blocked me on Twitter. Concha, if you're watching this, how dare you block me on Twitter? No, she blocked me too. She's not watching. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. There's a whole thing. If you uh, so disagreements aside, um, there's a video she did called Cringe. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of which has to do. Have you seen it? Uh huh. Oh, okay. Well, a lot of it has to do with the unique life experiences that Contra has had as a trans woman, uh, impacting her perception of the acceptability and moral status of deviant behavior when perceived in other trans people, or at least gender non-conforming people. And I thought it was interesting. You said a few times while talking about your opinion on drag queens and such that it's a you thing. Well, if it is a you thing. You know, um, then it's it's there's a lot of use. I think you know. Aww. I think that there's um, there are people now. Mind you, I don't think that an emotional bias in that form is an acceptable uh, justification for a political position. So there are a lot of use um, who should get over it. But I understand and sympathize with your perspective on that. Yeah. I'm glad. I think Conjure, that was a good video. The only thing I will say, though, is like a lot of the videos about Chris Chan. And I'm of the belief that people like that and Jessica and Eve, they're awful people, but we shouldn't be making them famous. Those, when you think of a trans people, those shouldn't be the first names in your mind. Like the fact that those are some of the first people that people think of when they think trans people, that's a problem. Because when you think of trans people, you think of crazy people. And that's not the image that we need to be having of trans people. So yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you can blame the media for that, right? They'll always pop oh, up the yeah. big, uh, you know, the, the the people they can make the vote. Listen, when when people Google trans, they should see me. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Um, I'll 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 rep the cause. I do appreciate you coming on sincerely. I really do. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have anything that you would like to shout out? Uh, I guess I will shout out myself. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. I have a TikTok. Yo, just follow me on Rose Millet anywhere you can find me. If you liked what I had to say, or even if you didn't, you want to leave a hateful comment? I don't think there's going to be that. There might be a few. It's okay. I'm all for discussions. You agree or disagree? Have fun. That's all I got to say. I really enjoyed being on here. Very pleasant conversation. I'm really surprised at how well this went. Yeah, you heard it here, folks. Go be hateful. I won't stop you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> no, don't, 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 I, ideally, nice. don't. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Quickly retracting that permission. Um, have a. Uh, She's going to get clipped. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.